All right, so welcome to the Outlaws of Thunder Junction set review. We'll also be covering the cards from the big score, and I have a few cards at the end from the commander sets, but for the most part, we're going to be going through the cards that we think are interesting for the various formats uh, in alphabetical order. So if you want to follow along at home, you can do so uh, just by going to Scryfall, looking up the Outlaws and big score sets and sorting them by A to Z. And I'll be describing the cards for anyone who's just listening or just needs a verbal reminder. So I am joined once again by Dylan. Welcome back. Mm -hmm. So our first cards are Abraded Bluffs and the various other cards in its cycle. So there's Abraded Bluffs, Bristling Backwoods, Chrysote Heath, Eroded Canyon, Festering Gulch, Forlorn Flats, Jagged Barrens, Lonely Arroyo, Ar Arroyo, Lush Oasis, and Soured Springs. And these are all lands that enter tapped. They, when they enter, deal one damage to target opponent, and they tap to add one of two colors. So there's one for each of the two color combinations. Uh, so firstly, they are all popper legal which is notable because Popper, of course, does not have very good lands in terms of at least its relation to other formats. And the lands that are dual color that show up in Popper are, there are the fetchable ones that are two different land types that can be fetched off of the Lord of the Rings land cyclers like Lorien Revealed. There are the indestructible artifact lands from Modern Horizons 2 that are run in artifact matter decks. There are the gain life lands, which are ETB gain one life, which are usually not played as much as the other ones, but they sometimes will show up just to supplement land bases and these ones i don't think they're going to like replace any of those but there are potentially two color lists that might want to have damage dealt uh beyond that what else do you think about them dylan yeah i mean um prior to lord of the rings the life gain land saw a bit more play in popper um so it's like pretty hard to compete with with those but um i mean i'm excited to play the, these cards in draft like like it just kind of hits all the bases for it but there is some um other constructed playability to uh to them as well um, notably, um, there's a scape shift spelunking combo deck in Pioneer that like has to use like convoluted like ways to win. And you could have played Sun Scorched Desert before, but like it, it being a colorless land kind of sucks. So you get to play like an actual like mana fixing land that's a win con now. Um, but these may show up if there's like some sort of like uh, crime payoff in Standard, which is probably unlikely considering how big Standard is. But uh, you do get to play. Uh, because they target, you do get to play some lands that actually will commit a crime, which matters for like Vodmir and Duelist to the Mind and stuff. So. I think there's a there's a kind of an awkwardness to them where like a lot of the aggro decks that will want a Sunsorch Desert type card are typically monocolor or really, really do not want to play tap lands. So I'm not sure yeah. exactly where these show up. So for example, if we look at Popper, like the, the Popper decks that are interested in dual lands that are not looking to play cycle lands or the ones that get that are fetchable off cyclers or uh the artifact ones so there's decks like you know gardens or turbo fog which are almost certainly going to want the gain life lands over these ones and then if you look at all the aggro decks it's like mono red uh delver which is not going to play two colors either there's like a lot of mono color decks the only and then when you look at like the two color aggro decks you get stuff like boggles which wants to play the artifact lands because of all that glitters and so it's like kind of hard to figure out a deck that wants to play these exactly yeah, I mean, I think something that stuck out to me with them was I've played a lot of, like, Synthesizer in the past, and, like, there's usually some room for uh, for this type of effect in that deck, and that deck kind of wants, like, the damage more than it would want, like, any sort of life gain. Um, that's, like, the only deck, I think, where you might actually want to play a bunch. Yeah, so uh, is that pretty much everything there is to say about these ones? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I guess before we move on, I really should have opened this up with uh, what your thoughts on the set overall are. Oh, yeah, uh... It's a little bit, so it's kind of a little jarring seeing a lot of the like random cards and mechanics. But I, I do like the set. I'm a, I'm a big fan. I think it does a lot. I think it has a lot of mechanics that encourage like interesting deck building. And I think there's like some puzzles with like not obvious payoffs. Uh, just a little bit more work to get stuff out of your cards, which I like the design of it. I really like the set, and you know, obviously it hasn't come out yet, and so we haven't gotten to play with it, but. Some of the things I like about it, I like all the aesthetics. I like how the themes are woven onto the cards, although there's weird like multiverse mixing where totally random stuff from other planes is on here. But for the most part, like, you know, cowboys, deserts, uh, outlaws, train robberies, that kind of stuff. It all seems to fit pretty well. I like plot a lot, which we'll get to. It looks love plot. like a pretty great mechanic. And importantly, the most important part for the set is there's nothing, there's no card in it that I look at that looks obviously completely broken or miserable to play against. Yeah, pretty much agree with that. I don't think there's any Fable the Mirror Breakers, Amalia's, Furies, none of that stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to move on 
There's Akul the Unrepentant. This is a four mana legendary black and red creature. It has two of each color pip, so it's BBRR. And it is a legendary scorpion dragon rogue. It's a 5-5 flying trample, and it says, Activated ability, sacrifice three other creatures. You may put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. Activate only as a sorcery and only once each turn. So decent on rate in terms of its abilities and stats for the cost, and has a way of sacking a whole bunch of creatures to basically show and tell a creature into play. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a really cool uh, variant of like putting a creature into play early. I think it's, I think three other creatures is like a huge amount, uh, especially with how interactive a lot of, a lot of magic decks are. I mean, I'm not sure what the best thing you can reasonably put in because there's not like outside of like say modern and legacy and stuff like that. Pioneer and standard don't really have much redundancy for this effect. So I would be a little bit skeptical of putting in like a Traxa or Titan of industry or something. Uh, Maybe there's like a six drop that's fine to cheat in. I in Pioneer, I guess you could play like Vane Ripper or something. But uh, I think it's a really cool design. I had a bunch of uh, early drafts with this card in my uh, deck dump. I, I made like forty Pioneer decks, and I kept trying to put this into one of them. Maybe like you can kind of curve it with like Hordling Outburst is like a two card uh, combo to like cheat stuff in. There's a bunch of creatures that replace themselves, uh, but I, I really like the design and I like the fact that it's. And just kind of like a big flyer helps mitigate that a bit. So I'm looking at it and like this is one of the cards you want to talk about on the list. And I'm just struggling to see where this would show up because if I compare it to something like Shieldred or Archfiend of the Dross, like it's just not as good as those creatures. So you really need that show and tell ability to be a payoff. And it's just it just seems like so much work to get that set up. You need three creatures in play. You need to then play a cool. You then need to have like a big bomb in your hand that you can cheat out. So I can't really see a deck wanting to try to set this up. Yeah, I, I think I think that's kind of where I was struggling to was when I was building a lot of these decks, it was like you kind of needed like more early creatures to make this work. And a lot of decks don't really like a lot of one drops kind of suck. And you kind of want to go one, two, three, play this. Uh, and that's just a lot to ask. Uh, I, I think there's some version that can play it, um, but I'm not I haven't like totally cracked it yet. But I think it's a card a lot of people want to see work because it's really cool. All right, so moving on. Annie joins up. So this is a series of enchantments. It's a kind of a cycle in the set, and they are basically enchantments that are somewhat based on legendary creatures, and they all have two abilities. They all have an ability that triggers when they enter, and then another ability that triggers or has some uh, payoff when you do something. So in the case of Annie joins up, it is a four mana nigh enchantment, one R green white. It's a legendary enchantment, and it says when it enters the battlefield, it deals five damage to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. And then it says, if a triggered ability of a legendary creature you control triggers, the ability triggers an additional time. So a panharmonicon for legendary creatures, but although the trigger is for anything that's triggering based on them, not just entering. And the problem that we usually get with things like panharmonicon effects or uh, doubling season or any of these like engine enchantments is that the problem or, or artifacts is usually that they enter and they don't do anything, but it, like immediately. So you'll play your Panharmonicon and then you've got to wait to your next turn to play the thing that's going to get the double triggers. In Annie's case, it immediately kills something. So it seems somewhat playable. Uh, I wonder if it could show up in like Enigmatic Fires since that deck also wants to play a bunch of enchantments. That deck is already playing all the colors that you need to play Annie joins up. And it's something that you can uh, transform from enigmatic incarnation into a five drop or just use it as a way to kill stuff what do you think yeah i think this card's really good uh yeah en enigmatic uh notably uh that deck typically plays in elish nord right now as well uh but you can also just like so you also get to play like coma and stuff which it's pretty good uh doubling comas uh beginning of a keep trigger um you can just like lock your opponent out pretty quick uh yeah i, I think it's just like a good card maybe bard class plays it um you know, just like having removal spells nice. So I will say I've played um, the Bard class deck before, and that deck really does not want to be in three colors. Yeah, but I mean, I think there's a version where the payoff is maybe enough, but the, the current builds are kind of like activated ability heavy, so you don't really like need that effect. Um, but that deck does kind of like desperately need removal, but I think like at least you can play it with Gigantha, which is like pretty nice. Mm -hmm. um, so we were kind of, we we're trying to like look at this for standard because I think there's like there's a ton of legends that you play right now in standard maybe there's a maybe the slow Girk deck wants to go back into white uh for this type of effect uh you can get some like pretty easy infinites in that deck with this um i don't know i, I i'm pretty excited to see this card and where it shows up but yeah i i i haven't made any decks with it yet but that's just because like it's pretty unique so yeah all right so next card up on the list we have archmage's newt this is a two mana blue creature it's a two two salamander mount 
And it says, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback until end of turn. The flashback cost is equal to its mana cost. The card gains flashback zero until end of turn instead if Archmage's new is saddled, and it has saddle three. So saddle, for anyone unaware, this is a new mechanic from the set. It's basically just crew for creatures. So you can tap any number of creatures that have the total power at least as much as whatever the saddle cost is. So here it's saddle for three. So you need at least three power worth of creatures to saddle it. And the biggest difference is essentially just that uh, you can only saddle at sorcery speed and of course the creature is always a creature as opposed to vehicles which are not creatures until you crew them so in this case we have a creature that is basically a snapcaster mage when you hit people with it except if you saddle it then it's then you get to cast the spell for free so go ahead take it away dylan yeah the immediate thing that came to mind with this type of effect was uh, thought seize in pioneer it was like mostly what i was looking at but like also cheap red removal spells uh, anything that like you're fine killing their creature and then immediately recasting, which is not a wide pool of spells. Unlike Snapcaster Mage, I think this is like a better tempo card uh, rather than like Snapcaster, which is like a better like reactive card. Uh, so I'm not sure the pool of effects. Uh, I did look at basically every card in Pioneer that has three power on turn three. So you can go one mana uh, Thought Seize or one mana removal spell, play this on two, three drop on three. Um, and it's just like, which like forces your opponent to trade basically uh there's not like a ton of good ones but uh just kind of like the the interaction with like cheaper removal spells is kind of where i would want to look yeah i feel like it would be easier to set up the ability to cast like cheap tempo spells rather than trying to saddle it to get some big spell for free yeah yeah that that's kind of where i'm at like that's why i think thought seize is like really good because you can go thought seize play this on two uh play removal spell thought seize them again just stuff like that. Yeah, definitely want like a bunch of one mana instance of sorceries with this effect rather than like cheating any sort of uh, nonsense with the flashback zero. Yeah, the other problem, of course, is going to be that it's a bear. So it's going to be kind of yeah. dubious to be able to play this and wait a turn and be able to attack with it through your opponents, which is why you probably want cards like Thoughtseize or really cheap removal spells to clear the way. Yep, yep. I don't really think I can like think of any deck that exactly wants it at the moment. So maybe yeah, it spawns I, some kind of new tempo archetype if it's good. I was going to say, I, I, I'm always a fan of evaluating cards from the perspective that formats change with the presence of a new set. And I think this set has a lot of cards that don't cleanly fit into really any decks in Magic right now. And so that's what I, li I like imagining like and, and trying to figure out like how to make cards work. And this is definitely a card I don't think it cleanly fits into anything currently. Uh, it doesn't you know, necessarily mean it's bad, but yeah. Is this card any shot in Phoenix? Uh, no. no okay. shot. Maybe, maybe as a sideboard, but I think they have a lot more better cards from the set than this okay so moving on to our next card we have arid archway this is a land that enters tapped when it enters you have to bounce a land to your hand and if another desert was returned this way so it's a desert as, as well if another desert was returned this way surveil one and you tap it for double colorless so previously we had guildless commons which was exactly this card except it wasn't a desert and it didn't surveil so this is essentially just a strict upgrade over guildless commons although that card sees no play but this is the first, I think, bounce land that's legal in Pioneer Forward. So you, again, you wanted this on the list, Dylan, so take it away. Yeah, that was basically it. Uh, I just wanted to mention that this is the only Pioneer legal, like, Karoo bounce land type effect in Pioneer. Uh, and we've seen those effects see play in Modern before. It's not unreasonable that there may be some deck down the line that would want to play a bounce land. So. All right. So just something to keep in mind for the future. If there's ever like, yep. I don't know, some scape shift thing or something that cares about lands. So moving on, we've got Assimilation Aegis. This is a three mana white and blue artifact equipment. Although the equipment part of that is kind of dubious, but let's just go through it. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, exile up to one target creature until it leaves the battlefield. So it's uh, not O-ring, but creature only O-ring. And whenever it becomes attached to a creature, for as long as Assimilation Aegis remains attached to it, that creature becomes a copy of a creature card exiled with Assimilation Aegis, and it equips for two. So the only reason I can think of that, like wanting this is that it is an equipment removal spell, and therefore is maybe... Like, it's tutorable removal with Stoneforge Mystic. I doubt it, but you couldn't have that. It's also uh, for any decks that were looking for this effect. So the artifacts that we have had so far typically have some sort of restriction so there's stuff like portable hole and glass casket that are limited by mana values i think this is the first artifact that has etv hit any creature you want so for a deck that maybe is playing like war of invention or maybe the artifact matters decks that are playing stuff like thousand moon smithy or metalwork colossus might want this what do you think dylan yeah 
obviously hammer time is what sticks out to a lot of people with it but yeah uh, i actually had a war person deck in my pioneer uh, deck dump that was playing a bunch of copies of this uh you also can play it in the blue white and soul decks and that for that deck the equip actually comes up because you can you can exile like a big creature with it and then equip and turn your creature into a bigger creature um so like that deck may play some number of copies any ingenious smith deck this card like slots in pretty well with um i i think this should see a reasonable amount of play in uh pioneer not really sure outside of that like i, I don't really necessarily buy that it's good in in hammer time in blue white hammer time well i think you evaluate this based on the exile part right and then the equipment part yes. is just yes. is just a bonus just if it comes extra. up yeah 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 like the blue white and soul deck like in in pioneer in particular the reason i mentioned that, that that deck plays like a lot of cheap creatures and it wants like hard removal and it doesn't really get hard removal so that deck can play this and being an artifact is like pretty relevant and then you also get to play the upside of well now i can turn my thraben inspector into like your graveyard trespasser or something so um, that deck gets to utilize both modes, but it primarily wants the exile room. That's why you play this card. Okay. So on to our next card, we have Aven Interrupter. This is a three mana, double white in the cost, two, two creature bird rogue. It has flash flying. And when it enters the battlefield, exile target spell, it becomes plotted and spells your opponents cast from graveyards or from exile cost two more to cast. So strangely enough, this is going to be our first plot spell. So to explain plot, plot is basically an ability that says you can pay a cost and exile the card. And then on a future turn, you can cast the card for free. So it's basically like suspend in a sense, but it suspends indefinitely and you can just cast it on any future turn after it's plotted. So Aven Interrupter specifically plots the card, but then makes the card that the person is casting cost two more. So essentially what this says is exile a spell off the stack. Your opponent can then cast that spell on any future turn for two mana is basically what it says, although there's a little finagling around that because if your opponent kills the Aven Interrupter, then they can just cast the card for free. Yep. It's essentially like a, a one-turn delay on anything, basically. I have no idea what you use this for, although the fact that it is th like the mono-white spell queller sort of is unique. So if there's decks that want that like would want this effect but they didn't have access to blue before, this gets you there. Uh, what are your thoughts, Dylan? Yeah, so... In, in Pioneer in particular, there's actually a couple decks where this is actually really good against. One of them is Bring to Light, and the trick there is if they tap out for Bring to Light on 4 or 5, you you can just, like, slow that down. You can actually just, like, cast this early, and then they can't ever... Uh, if they want to cast Bring to Light, they're not going to be able to cast anything unless they have the 2 mana, so it's, like, pretty good there. Uh, but Quintorius is also a deck where it's going to be like a pretty good tax. Like we've seen Ray Dan before, but being an instant speed card is much, much better. You can actually cast this in response to the Contorious Minus, and then you don't hit any spell. It's just now everything costs two more, and they just don't get to combo. Then you get to attack the Quintorious and kill it. Um, it's tutorable off of Court of Calling for Amalia or, or Fauna Shaman. Uh, Mono White Humans isn't really very popular anymore. They do play some non-humans typically when, that have this effect, but... Uh, Hitting adventure creatures sometimes matters, but I, I think it's mostly against like, like the Bring to Light decks and Quintorius that you would want this effect. Um, but I, I think just Mono White 2-2 two, two Spell Queller is good enough for aggro decks to see some play. Also, if you do hit Bring to Light, if you do hit Bring to Light with it, Bring to Light gets the card based on the colors you spend, so it can only they can only spend two colors if you do that, because the card's free uh, plus the two tax. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah, they still get to hit a Valky if they want, but but they don't get to hit like a board wiper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like pretty good against Bring to Light and Quintorius. So. As far as decks that want to play this, so we have seen Blue White Flash as a deck in Pioneer before, which maybe yep. wants this, although I think that deck also has just access to Spellcaller if they want it. I'm not sure to what degree yeah, this is. More of that yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's also a Rogue, although Rogues is a blue-black deck, but I guess that's worth mentioning. Party types. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So moving on. Oh, I guess also it's notable that it's a counterspell creature that can be like Court of Calling for at instant speed yep. or like cocoed into so again any deck that was going to do that could have potentially also played spell queller but if i don't know i doubt amalia wants this but if you're like an abzan deck or something then i i i think i would play one of these in amalia right now so okay so moving on we've got beast bond outcaster this is a three mana but not really we'll get to that it's a three mana green creature it's a three three human druid and it says when it enters the battlefield if you control a creature with power four or greater draw a card and it has plot for one in a green so now that we're off Aven Interrupter and we're on to our first real plot card, I think this is the time where we talk about all of the implications of plot. So plot basically allows you to... I think the main, the main thing that it lets you do is double spell more easily because you plot the card, and then on the next turn when you cast the card, you don't have to spend any mana to play it on that turn, which allows you to double, triple spell more easily since you don't have to pay for it. So 
in this case, it's basically a 3-3 for two mana that's on a delay. And then uh, you presumably want to get the card draw, so you want to have something that's bigger. Although there's plenty of cards that you could play on three that have power four and up, especially in green. Like Love Struck Beast is just one that comes to mind immediately. Uh, and then the plot cards also are in essentially in a position where if it's later in the game and you just happen to have the mana lying around to play them, you can just play them without plotting them ahead of time. Plot, I believe... Most, if not all of the cards with plot, the plot cost is less than their mana cost, or it's at least equal to it. Anyways, uh, what are your thoughts, one, on plot in general, and then two, on this card? Yeah, I was uh, very excitedly blabbering on about how much I love plot as a mechanic ever since it was spoiled. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, fan of it. I think it's really powerful. I think it encourages good strategic thinking, and I like mechanics that encourage players to uh, diverge from autopilot magic. Um, I, I like the mechanic a lot. I think cards like this really showcase it really well, uh, where there's a clear trade-off, right? Like, you know, you're clearly not doing something else on turn two, but you know, double spelling comes up with like ledger shredders and all these other, all these other things. Imidanes, uh, is, is one that we may also see, uh, come up as well. That's a card that wants you to play as many spells in one turn as possible. Yeah. There's a lot of cards in the yeah. set that say like, you know, if you cast spells for free or you didn't spend mana on it or you didn't cast a spell from your hand or if you cast two or more spells, that you know, your second spell causes some trigger to happen. So that's obviously lots of uh, interset synergies with the plot mechanic. Yeah, and, and notably, of course, <laughs> even Interrupter makes all of your opponent's plots cost more even if they didn't plot it with, uh, with the Aven itself. Um, yeah, I, I, I like this card a lot. Um, and I, like, I love the mechanic. Plot is really powerful. And I think a lot of Magic players should kind of get into the habit of realizing that Oftentimes, doing nothing to set up for a future turn is the better play, and Plot kind of holds their hand with that, teaches that. that. I guess two other things I should mention that if they weren't clear before, you can only Plot as a sorcery, so you can't like, oh, I'll just wait till my opponent's turn and then exile it at instant speed. No, you have to Plot as a sorcery. And then uh, I believe Suspend gives the creatures haste. Plot does not, so when the creature, so when you cast your Plot creature, you can't then attack with it immediately. There's also obviously the downside that Anything that you're plotting, you're not using it the turn you plot it. So if it's a creature, you can't block with it because you haven't put it into play yet. And any other spells will have similar delayed effects. So it's more about like, I'm going to get more value by plotting this and then casting it on a later turn as opposed to casting it right now. Yeah, and, and anything that's an instant or has flash that you've plotted, you can still only play as a sorcery, which does come up. So counter spells are not very good to plot off the couple cards that will allow you to plot other cards so uh, as far as beast bond outcaster himself goes i don't think this card is that great although you seem to be higher on it i just think it's yeah. like obviously if you're paying two for a three three that's a fine stats but the the draw card part really needs to be relevant and although i think that in itself is easy enough to set up with enough creatures that have power four plus on three mana i just don't think there's a deck that wants this like that's my yeah, major I, issue I, with it i basically agree with that i think this is mostly geared for limited i think this card is like really good and limited at least at first glance uh the one thing that there's another card later in the set the uh, the three mana outcaster also has plot that like curbs pretty well uh into that in standard and this strikes me as a card that like they had intended to see some amount of standard play uh but there, there's a few there's a few uh four power or greater creatures for three mana that are like reasonably playable in standard but you really need a big uh, reason to play green in that format because green creatures kind of suck yeah, there's also like the Nykthos deck, which is basically a dead deck at the moment. And the, but even if it wasn't, the problem is like it only has, it only gives you they, one they green would, devotion. Yeah. Th I, th I think that deck is actually like pretty solid right now, but they wouldn't want this card. Maybe there's like a humans variant that wants it because like you can plot this on two and then, you know, set it up on four, you know, maybe those, you know, the, the four to five color humans decks will typically play Adeline and sometimes Imidanes. And you can like maybe set that up, but. All right, so moving on from Beast Bond Outcaster, we've got Bovine Intervention. This is a two mana white instant, and it says destroy target artifact or creature. Its controller creates a 2 2 white ox creature token. So, following in the same vein as Get Lost, we now have even more removal spells that hit multiple types of things. Although a 2 2 ox is a significantly better token to give your opponent than, ran than two random map tokens, it also doesn't hit Planeswalkers. Although, I'm not sure to what extent artifacts is a better thing to hit than enchantments or the other way around. It doesn't strike me as like a great removal spell, but it is, you know, two mana hits multiple things, potentially sees some sideboard play. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I I think it's it's worse than get lost to killing creatures, but hitting artifacts sometimes comes up. At least in Pioneer, you can hit like portable holes, uh, something like that. Um, Vehicles that haven't been crewed. Yeah, witches ovens, stuff like that. So, but again, yeah, like two two is a huge huge drawback compared to two map tokens, which basically doesn't ever come up at all. And that's why we see we see get lost in almost every white creature sideboard in Pioneer. They usually just play two copies. 
Um, I don't really expect this card to see much play, but it's nice that we have an option, I think. I think this is a way of hitting multiple types that I like, where it has a pretty clear drawback, um, but it hits a unique combination of types. Basically, to put this in perspective, something like Rapid Hybridization is legal yeah. in Pioneer as well, and that card sees absolutely no play whatsoever. Although, to be yeah. fair, <laughs> the token is a 3-3 rather than a 2-2, but the point is, like, giving your opponent, or, like, Swan Song is another card. Like, Swan Song comes up in EDH, where it doesn't matter because you've got three opponents that are at 40 life, and everyone's just combo winning yeah. anyway, but... Nobody plays Swan Song outside of that. And it's the kind of thing where giving your opponent a creature token that is actually able to attack you is such a worse drawback than giving your opponent a, uh, you know, random map tokens or, you know, life in the form of like swords to plowshares or whatever. Like a, a, a creature, like a creature token is an actual drawback as opposed to other random, uh, reparation type mechanics out of the removal spells it's it's funny you mentioned rapid hybridization i actually played rapid hybridization in a pioneer deck a few weeks back <laughs> well, what, what was it uh there's this deck i've been working on that is a py uh, pyromancer uh, storm where you use young pyromancer plus invasion of segovia and you cast your whole deck and you win the game and rapid hybridization is like a free spell in that so you shoot your own thing and make two tokens yeah uh, yeah, because because so yeah, because you, you get to play Stoke the Flames, so you can like curve and stuff, and then you get to chain all these spells together. Yeah, the only times I ever see cards like Rapid Hybrid and Pongify come up is in like weird combo yeah. aggro decks that are like trying to evolve their creatures or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted something that kind of protects Pyro because when they go to kill it, you just can kill your own Pyro, and make it three three, and sometimes you kill a bigger creature. So it was pretty good. All right, so moving on from Bovine Intervention, we've got Bristly Bill Spine Sower. This is a 2-mana, two 2-2 two, two Legendary Green Plant Druid, and it has Landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield of your control, put a plus-one counter on target creature, and you can pay 5-mana, which includes two green pips. Double the number of plus-one counters on each creature you control. So I have no idea what you do with this outside of maybe some weird Hardened Scales shenanigans and Pioneer, but what do you think? That's it. <laughs> That's it. I think that's it. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's some kind of standard aggro deck that wants to play this kind of weird effect. There's a, a three mana, like, green Luminar Gasparant creature in the set as well that, like, can double counters and stuff. So, yeah, maybe there's a standard uh, green counters aggro deck. But, yeah, probably just hardened scales in some capacity. Okay. I guess another thought process. There's two other places where I can maybe see this doing something. Uh, the first is in fetch land formats. This is a 4-4 on turn three. I don't like that's basically Tarmogoyf stats. So right. Tarmogoyf is like barely playable anymore. So I don't know how good that is. Uh, the second place would be if you've got some weird like scape shift, like put a bunch of lands into play deck. Maybe this does something if you need like something on turn two for your curve. I'm, I'm not really sure. Yeah. It looks like a pretty interesting card. I would be interested to see this show up in cubes. Mm -hmm. but that's basically it. Okay. Yep. So moving on, we have Bruce Tarl Roving Rancher. This is a 4-mana Boros Commander. It's a 4-3 Human Warrior. Oxen you control have Double Strike. And whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, exile the top card of your library. If it's a land, you create a 2-2 Ox. Otherwise, you can cast the spell until the end of your next turn. So it's, as far as I can tell, like a curve topper for multicolor human decks in Pioneer. Or I guess it's kind of a card resource engine on 4 for decks that are interested in creatures like this kind of awkward that it only has three toughness so it dies to a bunch of burn spells but what do you think yeah uh i actually have this in a couple sideboards right now notably as pia it's a supplement to showdown of the scalds uh like yeah that deck post board you get pretty grindy you're going to be able to play this and cast a spell a bunch you really don't want to hit lands uh by the time you have four in play off of this so like the two twos actually matters in that deck uh it, it is a, it is a warrior which does come up for the colossus hammer deck in pioneer which is seeing slightly more play uh, and, and may have some potential with the combo later in the set. Um, but yeah, I think it's mostly just a curve topper for some low curve decks. Uh, just, yeah, but I, I think the best case scenario with this card is you play it, you make a 2-2, your opponent kills it, you just have a free 2-2, which is like pretty reasonable in these low curve decks. But I think Pia was the one where I was mostly playing this um, because it does uh, work with uh, other cards in that. Case, so. Okay, so next card. Any other playable Ox in the formats? I, I highly doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> So moving on, we've got Calamity Galloping Inferno. This is a 6-mana red Legendary Horse Mount. It's a 4-6 with haste, and it says whenever it attacks while saddled, the saddle cost is 1 power. Whenever it attacks while saddled, choose a non-legendary creature that saddled it this turn and create a tapped and attacking token that is a copy of it. Sack the token at the beginning of the next end step. Repeat this process once. So it's a 6-mana 4-6 with haste that if you saddle it, which you can saddle with anything because it just needs 1 power, you get to double copy a non-legendary creature that saddled it and have those two tokens tapped and attacking and then they die. 
Uh, this is one of the cards you wanted on here, so let me know why. So really the only reason I wanted this is because there is kind of a combo with it where you play a five drop and then you play Calamity and you win, but you can. there's also a couple cards that put both of them into play, and it's Terror of the Peaks, which is going to be in standard now. So Terror of the Peaks plus Calamity is like 23, 20-something, 20 you know, 20-ish damage on, on curve. Um, so that that's mostly why I wanted to mention that. Like, it's cl- that's close to playable enough in standard, and I believe there's Thunderous debut in standard and the Seven Mana Saga uh, and one of the new cards from the set that both let you put two things into play. So there's basically the, the you know, quote-unquote combo with it is essentially there are certain creatures that you can play on, like, five that if you then immediately follow it up with Calamity and Saddle it and your opponent has no removal, you basically just win the game immediately? Yes, yes. Which does require that you have five drop into six drop with no removal from your opponent. Yeah, yeah. You know, I- However, the like, yeah, there's not. It's the standard format doesn't have a ton of removal that's going to hit Terror of the Peaks or Calamity. Um, I'd be more worried about losing on board by the time you play that. But there's not a ton of removal that hits this, and Koth is still in standard. So, um, and that card is like pretty close to being good, and that does ensure that you hit your land drops, and sometimes it's a removal spell to kind of catch back up. So maybe there's some version with that. All right, so. Moving on to Canyon Crab, the card that people are probably going to be like, why the hell are we talking about this card the most? It is a two mana blue uh, crab that's a zero five, and you can pay two mana, which includes a blue pip, to give it plus two minus two. And it says at the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn, loot. So draw, then discard. And so uh, Dylan wants to talk about why this is good in butts, apparently. Yes. Uh, just that I, I think... I'm always on the lookout for more creatures that have some small upside. Uh, so that's that's it mostly. Like I, I think like Assault Formation, Pride of the Whole Clade, like maybe it wants more cards that are just standalone pretty reasonable. It's kind of like without any payoffs can still like represent a pretty reasonable clock or like sometimes loot and stuff. So for those who have no idea what we're talking about, the the butts deck, as I'm referring to it, is a experimental pioneer deck that is usually in the bant colors that plays a bunch of creatures that have low cost, high toughness, and then plays cards that make your creatures deal damage based on toughness. So those decks are always looking for, or that deck specifically is always looking for creatures that have a low cost, usually like two mana and under, and have toughness around usually at least five. But there's plenty of creatures that have those stats. So the deck is also now looking for creatures that have relevant abilities and the ability to maybe sometimes you can loot matters. Yeah, also when you don't have a payoff, you can just like, on, on, on turn four, you can just pop this twice, hit them for four. So it kind of does stuff on its own without any payoff, which like is always something looking out for. That deck's problems go far beyond like the creature quality. This card, um, it's like oh, it's fine. Like I guess I would t- if, if that if I was going to play that deck, I guess I would test this to see if it's good in it. Yep, that's basically my thoughts. And if you're interested in seeing gameplay, I have two videos on my channel where I play uh, through two different leagues with the butt deck. But uh, yeah, that deck has major problems beyond just the the creatures anyway moving on we've got caught in the crossfire this is a double red two mana instant and this is our first example of spree so spree is a mechanic that is kind of like multi-kicker it's basically so the spree cards are all modal spells that have different abilities on them and you can pay additional costs to get one two or all of the abilities on the card so in this case the abilities are and for an additional one generic mana it deals two damage to each outlaw creature so bringing up Outlaws, Outlaw is another mechanic in this set. It's basically just a suite of different creature types, similar to how like Party was a suite of diff- four different creature types. Outlaws are any creatures that are an Assassin, Mercenary, Pirate, Rogue, or Warlock. So for an additional one mana, deal two damage to every Assassin, Mercenary, Pirate, Rogue, and Warlock on the battlefield. And then for an additional one generic mana, it deals two damage to each non-Outlaw creature. So you can pay three mana to deal two to each outlaw creature, three mana to deal two to each non-outlaw creature, or four mana to deal two to every creature. Uh, specifically, one thing to bring up with the spree mechanic is that you cannot cast the spell for no modes. So if you had like, you know, Young Pyromancer or some other effect that just cares about you casting spells, you can't just cast the spell with no additional costs paid. Uh, other than that, this seems like one of a million different variants of the three mana deal two to everything card, which we've seen a whole bunch of, and this one just specifically applies to outlaws and I guess non-outlaws. So uh any more thoughts on that in terms of that regard dylan or the spree mechanic in general uh i i I like modal mechanics i'm not the biggest fan of spree as it's done i think it's it just yeah i I don't like it um but i i like this card uh usually i'm like the three minute two damage instant speed with like you know restrictions and stuff effects usually see some amount of play 
in Pioneer and Standard. Uh, this one is a little more flexible than most, and it's pretty reasonable to hit like none of your creatures with it, which is nice. Um, but I don't expect this to see very much play, just a little bit. So the previous, the, the two probably most known versions of this effect is Fiery Cannonade, which is three mana instant deal two to all the non-pirates. And there's Dragon Breath, which is deal two to all the non-dragons. So those are the ones that see play in Popper specifically. And which one you pick really just depends on which creatures are prevalent. So if you have your, you can use them one as an asymmetrical card, basically. Like if you're an aggro deck that's playing all or mostly whatever the creature type is that gets excluded, you can use this to be an asymmetrical sweeper. And in, but in most cases, it's just going to be a sweeper. So which one you pick depends on the creatures that are being played. And if any of those prevalent creatures that you need to sweep up are of the type that is excluded from the damage. Although in this case, you can also hit non-outlaws as well. So there's maybe like you can hit outlaws or non-outlaws, but there's also times when there might be a mix of different creatures. So in general, with this kind of effect, you want the least amount of exclusions possible, which is why in Popper, for example, Dragon Breath has completely taken over over Fiery Cannonade because there are mono red pirate creatures that don't get hit by Fiery Cannonade and Popper. So this would I, this one can kill them, but then you have to be able to also kill everything else on the board. So this is probably not going to see any play in Popper at least. Or I guess I guess it can't see play in Popper because it's an uncommon. But like you get my point. Like if if you're looking for this kind of effect, you're going to want usually the sweeper that hits the most amount of creatures, and this one has the most exclusions out of any of them that we've seen so far. Yeah, I I think this is mostly geared for like standard where. They wanted a card that hits outlaws, but they also want a card that, you know, is a slight, like, outlaw payoff, and this kind of fits the bill. Also, can we say that, so party, what were the creature types in party? It was rogue, wizard, warrior, and what was the last one? Cleric. Cleric, Cleric. okay. So, which was, you know, your, your typical D&D party, right? So this one is outlaws, so it's like, you know, all the criminals, right? So I'm like, okay, assassin, all right, checks out. Mercenary, okay, checks out. Pirate, checks out. Rogue, checks out. And then warlock is like a complete left curve. What? I, I think Warlock is fine. Like, usually they're kind of like rogue mages, kind of, you know, basically, you know. I, I think War, Warlock is the fits the least, but I don't hate it on there. Okay. It just felt weird to me. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we'll get to, by the way, for another card coming later in the set, the notable outlaw creatures that get played. But in the meantime, let's move on to Caustic Bronco. So we had our uh, Snapcaster Mage dude with saddle earlier this is our dark confidant dude with saddle so it is a two mono black two two creature snake horse mount that's quite the type whenever it attacks reveal the top card of your library and put it into your hand you lose life equal to the card's mana value if it isn't saddled otherwise each opponent loses that much life and it has saddle for three so it attacks if it so first of all you don't have to connect with your opponent you just have to attack them then if it wasn't saddled dark confidant you lose life equal to the mana value of the card you reveal and you get it but if you did saddle it, then your opponent loses the life instead. Take it away, Dylan. Yeah, so just so we're clear, this is Dark Confidant. Uh, they both require you to untap with the card anyway. Uh, and if you're untapping with the card, you're going to be able to attack with it. So this is Dark Confidant has to attack. We've never seen that type of effect before. I think this actually, you know, is better overall than Dark Confidant. Like, the one toughness matters, the saddling matters. Um, I think the uh, there was a lot of people that were like, you know, wanting more old modern staples in Pioneer, and this is a good way to do it, reintroduce it uh, with an updated manner. Uh, I I assume this card will see a pretty reasonable amount of play in Standard. I'm excited to try it out in a bunch of Pioneer decks and, and see if Dark Confidant can pass the test. Uh, yeah, it may suck putting a Vein Ripper into your hand, but <laughs> you've got a Vein Ripper, so I think that's okay. There's a lot of, un unlike the Newt, like this just triggering on attack means that like it always replaces itself so you're fine attacking this into a blood tithe or a fabled mirror breaker board where they can just trade it away and you draw your card um most pioneer decks and standard decks now don't have a high curve especially the ones that play creatures you can copy it with fable i guess which is like you know pretty neat niche but like i don't know uh, i think this card's really cool i am excited to play it a bunch uh notably graveyard trespasser can saddle it on turn three and so can bone crusher giant so i'm gonna play and I guess Blood Tithe Overseer. So I'm going to play around a bunch with, those, with it in those kinds of decks. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like the card a lot. And we'll see if Dark Confidant is playable in 20. Yeah, so the, the basic question here is essentially because like Dark Confidant exists and basically sees play nowhere. Yeah. it's Dark, Dark Confidant is essentially like sometimes good in cube. And then very rarely I'll see it show up as like in some legacy or modern deck where it oftentimes is like some kind of sideboard card. So you might have something like uh, I don't know, you're playing Storm and you sideboard in Dark Confidant after they take all the removal out and now you've got an extra card every turn. So something like that where your opponent just isn't prepared to deal with it. But realistically, Dark Confidant basically sees no play. So the the main question is, I guess, 
or there's two questions. The first is, is Caustic Bronco basically Dark Confidant? And then if it is Dark Confidant, would Dark Confidant see play if it was Pioneer legal? Yeah, or standard, yeah. So moving off of Caustic Bronco, we have Claim Jumper. This is a three mana white three, three creature, Rabbit Mercenary. We're just going all out with the creature types in this set. It has Vigilance. And when it enters the battlefield, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for a planes card and put it onto the battlefield tap. So any planes land, not just basics. Then if an opponent controls more lands than you, repeat this process once. If you search your library this way, shuffle. So if your so three mana three three vigilance. If your opponent has more lands when it enters, you go get a planes. Then if they still have more lands, you go get another planes. This kind of effect we see over and over and over again on white commander deck cards. And this is, I think, the first time we've seen it in just like a regular set that's not a commander set. We had uh, from the Zendikar card. There, no, it was AFR the 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 two mana three one uh, vigilance creature uh, that grabbed one. The, the point playing standard. The point being, like, this is a this is a mechanic that we usually or an ability that we usually see on commander cards. So yeah, really I don't popular. I don't know how good it is in like competitive one v one formats. Basically. You would never play a 3 mono 3 3 with Vigilance that didn't do anything. So you have to be behind on lands for it to matter. And then even in that case, like, I don't really know what deck wants to play a 3 mono 3 3 Vigilance that goes and finds a land. But where, where do you yeah, see this, Dylan? Play, yeah, when they already don't play Knight of the White Orchid or the, the 2 mana 3 one. The only possible deck where I would play this is periodically in Pioneer. Uh, there's a green, white, Yorian, Fauna, Shaman, like, toolboxy deck. And that deck usually would want an effect like this. Um, because they play kind of a lower land count. It's usually like 28 to 30 lands, which is pretty low for a Yorian deck. You play land war elves and stuff, so you can mid it. So like uh, a three mana three three is terrible, but a two mana, like playing it on turn two is like pretty reasonable. Um, like I don't think a Molly would play it. You, you can grab surveil lands off of it, which will come up in the green white Yorian deck. Uh, that deck also typically plays Fierce Empath plus Decimator of the Provinces. So hitting your land drops is pretty good. Sometimes they play Angel of Serenity. Uh, Yorian nonsense also is pretty mana intensive. Uh, Lair of the Hydra, so so that's a deck where I think you could play this. Other uh, decks where this effect has seen play before is in standard. Um, the what is, it, what is it, Loyal Warhound or something? Yeah, the the two mana three one saw a pretty good amount of play in standard. Uh, that was around the Allruns Epiphany era of standard, and there was a green white mid range deck with uh, Felidar Retreat, and that deck played a bunch of copies of the two mana three one. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything that immediately comes to mind with this in standard, except maybe the mono white, uh, the mono white deck would play some number of this. It's weird that th these cards are much better on the draw than they are on the play, uh, which is obviously something you don't have much control of. Mm -hmm. so. That's why I've never particularly been a fan of them because their cards were basically, they don't do anything relevant when you're ahead or on the play, basically. Yeah, that's why the, the idea for a lot of the Knight of the Reliquary decks, or not Knight of the Reliquary, Knight of the White Orchid, Orchid yeah. yeah, was to, you would board them out on the play, and you would bring them back in on the draw. Uh, we, we did see with Heliod, we saw that deck played a uh, four Knight of the White Orchid, but you could grab Idyllic Grange to help combo uh, in, in Pioneer. Um, that was the last time we played a bunch of copies of that effect. I just don't think, like, this deck, this effect is even that great uh, to begin with, it, especially in EDH. This just, like, they love to cram this ability all over white EDH cards, this whole, yeah, if you're if you're behind, do a thing, not even just get a land. Yeah. And those cards are always bad. Yes. All right, moving on from Claim Jumper, we've got Collector's Cage. This is a two-mana white artifact, and it has Hideaway 5. When this artifact enters the battlefield, look at the top five cards of your library, exile one face down, then put the rest on the bottom in a random order, and then it has one tap. Put a plus one counter on target creature you control. Then if you control three or more creatures with different powers, so Coven, you may play the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So again, two mana artifact enters, you look at the top five cards, exile one face down, then one tap, put a plus one counter on target creature, and then if you have creature three creatures with different powers, you get to cast the card without paying for it. Uh, notably... Hideaway is one of the most effed abilities I've ever seen because they keep changing how it works. So originally Hideaway was it always looked at four cards and the card entered tapped because it was on lands. Then they came out with Watcher for Tomorrow in Modern Horizons. And that card, Hideaway uh, doesn't, like the car, all the cards that, that Hideaway was on before were lands that said this land enters the battlefield tapped. In this case, Watcher for Tomorrow had the enters tapped part hidden in the reminder text of Hideaway. So you had to read that to realize that, that Watcher entered tapped. Now they've changed it again, where now you can hide away for different amounts of cards, and now it doesn't enter tapped. Yeah. So, I mean, I, things should be changed when they're outdated, in my opinion. Like, I, I am happy with the hideaway changes. I think it's better for the design and stuff. Um, but 
I like the mechanic in general. It, it, it is funny. Yeah, it's, it's changed significantly in, in, in function and application um, since. But, um, but I, I, I like that it doesn't enter tap now, so you can do the thing immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mostly wanted to talk about this because fight rigging has been fringe playable in Standard and Pioneer. The problem is that that requires one big creature. This is a lot easier to build, and you can actually do it on turn three in Standard. If you play Teething Wormlet on turn one, and then you play uh, Yoshin Frontliner on turn two with another one drop, we'll just give it to you right there. Um, so maybe there's something to look at in Pioneer when you can play Ornithopter as well as another uh, another way to trigger this. Um, that's mostly it, really. Is I, They've been wanting to make the green-white artifact deck like you know a playable deck in Standard. We've seen a bunch of green green cards that care about artifacts, white cards that care about artifacts, and some multicolor cards in standard legal sets, and maybe this is enough to finally see a teething more wet deck. Also, I guess it's technically a two-mana permanent that can add a plus-one counter to something every turn, which is similar to the Ozolith's ability, Ozolith's Shattered yep. Spire. So yep. if there's that like a green-white well. scales deck, maybe this wants it? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you also have, uh, is it Elvish Archivist or something? The, that cares about when you know, when artifact enters, you put two counters on it. Um, enchantment, you draw a card, uh, that type of effect. So there's a lot in the standard card pool that could make a green-white uh, artifact deck. Oh, I guess also, I haven't mentioned so far the whole big score versus outlaws thing. So just to explain that, because <laughs> this is the big score. So yes. outlaws of Thunder Junction was originally planned to be, there was going to be outlaws of Thunder Junction, the main set. And then there was going to be the, there was going to be a supplemental set afterwards that is was going to be similar to March of the Machine and then March of the Machine Aftermath, where it was intended to be a small set that had much fewer cards. But March of the Machine Aftermath was so hated and sold so poorly that they were able to change it before releasing the product. So they just bundled big score cards into the main set. And that's why we've got cards that are in the same set, but they have technically different sets that they're a part of and have different set symbols. Also, Outlaws has a bunch of like bonus sheet cards that are similar to the like enchantments, special enchantments from Eldrain or other like bonus sheet cards that are not legal in standard that are reprints. So that's another thing that's in the set, but it's not technically, they're all reprints. So we're not talking about them here, but that's what's going on in Outlaws. Oh, also there's a commander exclusive cards, which we'll get to at the end. A lot going on. Anyway, yes. Colossal Rattleworm is a four mana green creature. It's a six five. It has flash as long as you control a desert. It also has trample, whether or not you control a desert. And then it says, uh, one in a green, exile it from your graveyard, search your library for a desert card, put it onto the battlefield tapped. Okay, so there's two ways that you can look at the card. One is it's a four mana six five with trample and flash if you have a desert that incidentally after it dies also has this extra little tacked on ability that gets you a, a desert out of your library. Or if you have some sort of like self mill graveyard dredge thing going on, it's a card that's in your graveyard that can go get you a land. So why did you want to discuss this? Yeah, so the main reason is like I'm always happy when there's more desert payoffs. Like this card is pretty mediocre uh, in modern magic, but maybe there's some kind of weird standard deck that'll play it where it's kind of like when this dies, you can like ramp and grab a desert that pings the opponent for one or something. Um, I'm not really sure like where it would have a home form. And a six five is not small in standard. Um, and the one of the issues currently with like green creatures is there's not quite enough like big enough creatures that, that do things that maybe there's some kind of standard green stompy deck or whatever. Um, they are kind of lacking on like four drops that can attack through creatures. Um, thankfully, there's not very many shoulder troops right now, but uh, still six, six, five trample that you can play on turn three and in standard is, is not like small. So that's mostly what I'm looking at. Like the exile from your graveyard search for a desert is basically flavor text. Um, but I, that's basically like once Rattleworm dies, if you happen to have some extra mono lying around on one turn, yeah. you can use that. Yep. Uh, yeah, there's I mean, also grab a new one. there's also the potential for if there's a so sometimes there will be like a flash deck which is usually in blue and white but not always sometimes yeah. it's in band or it's like in green blue so if there's a, a yeah. flash deck that's just playing all instant speed cards and that deck is also playing a sufficient amount of deserts this could be another like the top end flash threat yeah yeah I, I think uh, there used to be a blue green flash deck in Pioneer that played. What is the, the the four mana wolf? Uh, Night pack ambusher, cast, I think, is what it's yeah, called. Yeah, if you haven't cast a spell, yeah, and and maybe the slots in that that deck kind of wanted more more redundancy. Um, so me, yeah, I mean, they also frilled mystic as in pioneer as well. So like, you kind of do have you know, a bunch of options, but 
but yeah, I, don't know. It's, I think it's mostly just like a big beater that sometimes does a couple other things. By the way, off topic, but you've this is not the first time you've mentioned that Shieldred isn't seeing anywhere near as much play in standard right now. What exactly is going on? Like, wasn't Shieldred literally all over the place where it, to the point where every single deck was a black midrange deck and now it's not being played as much? Yeah, because there's more creatures that push through it. The removal spells you know, are close to the same, but it just doesn't quite do enough in the card pool. Like, there's not enough decks that are drawing extra cards. Um, Domain doesn't really care about that card. I mean, Domain's not like as super popular anymore. There's a bunch of decks that play like, you know, just creatures that are better at attacking and just like the tempo is better. Also, you know, it, it's weird, but like um, the bat, Deep Cavern bat is, or is insane in the format. And you would rather just play more three drops than twos and threes and curve. And there's a lot more cheap flyers now to go over Shouldered. So it's just like the games are not... A, about playing shoulder and then untapping with any it just is kind of just a four mana four five with death touch and there are better creatures in standard now which is hilarious that shoulder is so expensive when it basically is dead in both standard and pioneer it doesn't see any substantial play vampires in pioneer plays one copy usually at most and even then kalidus is better right now so uh, is vampires in pioneer shoulder. just better than mono black midrange or not mono black um like the the typical rakdos, rakdos midrange mid, deck yeah but, but it is rakdos mid you just play Soren. So it's just the better version. It's just a better version of Rakdos mid. Yeah, because because you can actually beat Lotus Field because you have a faster clock. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, moving on from the Rattleworm, we've got Conduit Pylons, the most exciting card in the set. So this is a desert land. It enters the battlefield. Uh, you surveil one, and it taps for colorless, and you can pay one and tap to add one mon of any color. The only reason this is here is because it's popper legal, and in popper there are certain decks that will play filter lands like this. So specifically. Crystal Grotto, which shows up in Tron lists. And Crystal Grotto is exactly the same card as this, except it's not a desert and it scries instead of surveils. So it's not exactly clear that scry is always 100% better than surveil or like worse than surveil, but it usually is worse. So I would expect that. And, and there's cards that get stuff back from your graveyard in Popper as well, like uh, Pulse of Marat. Yeah. Was it Pulse of Maratha? The three mana target creature or land comes back from your graveyard, gain Pulse six. Of Marasa, yeah. yeah, Pulse of Marasa. And there's like some other cards that care about things being in your graveyard. So probably just replaces all the Crystal Grottos and all the Popper decks that are playing it. And that'll be the end of that. Anything else to add? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I actually have it in one deck currently in Pioneer, and that's Quintorius in the Scryland slot. Like instead of playing, or the Surveil Land, instead of playing one of the tapped Surveil Lands, I just play this. Um, I think. There was some fringe spelunking decks that would sometimes play uh, like Crystal Grotto, Grotto type cards. Um, and this is like an upgrade to that. It is a desert, which could matter for like an hour of promise deck or something. But yeah, it's all pretty fringe. I think it's mostly mostly just popper. All right. Moving on past the conduit pylons, we've got Demonic Ruckus. This is a two mana red aura. It enchants a creature. The enchanted creature gets plus one menace and trample. And when the Demonic Ruckus dies, you draw. And it has plot for a single red. So I imagine the reason you wanted this on the list is probably Pioneer Heroic. Uh, yeah, actually a ton of decks. Um, Pioneer Heroic is a pretty easy one because oftentimes you don't want to play your... If you have... You don't play a ton of creatures and you want to protect them. So oftentimes you don't play a creature on turn one, but you'll play it on two with protection. Or you want to trigger Illuminator Virtuoso immediately and, and get it out of burn range on a turn where they're tapped out. Uh, so you can plot this on one and then set that up on turn two or three. Also plays really well with Slick Shot show off from the new set as well so you can get that which is like a pretty aggressive curve uh you can plot this on one play that on two cast it uh this may show up in just the straight up like other monastery swiss spear decks maybe pia plays some number because you play soul scar mage and swiss spear and you can plot this on one play pia on two cast this on pia when, a, when your opponent's tapped out get it out of burn range make a one one immediately a ton of applications uh Zenawan posted on twitter that this may be good enough to make the Aras deck in Pioneer shift to red-white based, because you can play four of this, you can plot on one, you can play SRAM or Light Paws on two and immediately uh, trigger it. And being able to trigger Light Paws on two is actually pretty big for that deck because you can grab an Alpha Authority and just give it Hexproof immediately, and then the game is going to be over on the next turn. Um, and you can play like, you know, protective one drops for more redundancy to set that up. So I think this card is really good. <laughs> Menace and Trample is really nice for that. So um, is the idea here that basically the plot is the main, the, the plot yes. part of it is the part that matters and the, yes. and the, whatever the rest of the card said essentially is irrelevant. You just want a, an aura spell that you can play for free that just targets your guy or, or triggers your prowess triggers or whatever. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's important that it pumps. Of course, um, Menace and Trample may as well be unblockable. 
um, in a lot of decks. But but yeah, the main thing is it's a it's a pump effect that plots. And yeah, I, I think this will see a lot of play. All right. So moving on, we've got Duelist of the Mind. It is a two mana blue creature. It's a human advisor. It has star power and three toughness. It's flying and vigilance. The power is equal to the number of cards you've drawn this turn. And it says, whenever you commit a crime, you may draw a card. If you do discard a card, this ability only triggers once a turn. So commit a crime is another mechanic from the set. And what committing a crime means is anything that targets your opponent, targets a opponent's permanent, or targets a card in an opponent's graveyard is committing a crime. So whenever you target your opponent, target a permanent they control, or target a card in their graveyard, you can loot, but only once per turn. And this is a star three where the power is equal to the number of cards you've drawn this turn. Also notably, this is the... Uh, card that was made for Nathan Stewart, world champion of uh, world champion number 28, I believe is what that is. So uh, the world champion gets to make like a special showcase card, which is essentially like they get to design a card and then wizards will print it with obviously they probably can't just design anything they want, but they get to essentially submit a design and then work with wizards to get that card printed. So that's what this card is. Anyway, uh, I would presume that this card is probably maybe good in Phoenix. So why do you want to talk about Duelist? So it's funny. I, I don't really expect this to see much play in Phoenix, but I am a huge fan of Prof's Eidetic Memory. I've been playing that card a lot. I think the card is really good in Pioneer right now. Um, and we have seen a Prof's Eidetic Memory deck pop up where it's kind of, because you, you play Rona with it as well, Ledger Shredder. The Ledger Shredder curves are pretty gross with effects like this where you can uh, you can play this on two or Prof's Eidetic Memory on two. Play Ledger Shredder, play a one mana spell, connive. If you if it's a Thought Caesar, Fatal Push, you can commit a crime, draw again, you know, attack for a bunch. Treasure Cruise is legal in Pioneer, so like any of those Treasure Cruise decks. Um, I, I'm just happy to play it alongside Prof's Eidetic Memory, where you can set up like pretty quick combo kills. I think you should be able to kill on turn four, um, no problem um, with this type of card. Um, I don't think Phoenix would would play this card specifically, but there are consider treasure cruise decks in the format right now that play Prof's Eidetic Memory that would want to be this. So does this card fall basically into the category of probably not good enough, but looks good enough to at least be worth testing? Oh, I, I think it'll be good enough, but it it doesn't go into a ton of decks, if that makes sense. Okay. It's pretty narrow, but I do think it's really good. All right. So moving on from Duels to the Mind, we've got Dust Animus. This is a two mana, two, three spirit. It is a uh, white spirit. It has flying. It is says if you control five or more untapped lands, it enters the battlefield with two plus one counters and a lifelink counter on it, and you can plot it for two mana. So you had mentioned that this might be something that Spirits wants, although Spirits seems to be an incredibly dead deck right now because both Amalia exists and uh, Smuggler's Copter is legal, but uh, give me your thoughts yeah. on Dust Animus. So Spirits is actually pretty good again in Pioneer, but it looks very different than it did before. They themselves are Smuggler's Copter, Wandering Emperor kind of deck with no curious obsessions anymore they, they go a little more like a blue white mid-range flash kind of deck um and so this kind of fits a little bit better into that um notably spirits is a little better now that and this is one of the weaknesses of vampires in general the, the vein ripper soren package is really powerful but the drawback is you don't get to play as many removal spells and katilda and spirits are actually really good against um uh, rakdos vamps uh, so that's like a big reason to, to be playing uh, Spirits right now. Um, so like, yeah, maybe the slots as like, you know, a two of in that kind of deck. Uh, the games are going a little bit longer with them. You can reasonably just plot this and then play it on the next turn just as a free creature and hold up a uh, spell queller. If you're on the play, usually you don't need to counter anything on two and then you can just set up for a bigger turn on three. Um, notably, like you can't plot at instant speed. So if you if you plot this, it 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 doesn't matter if you have a rattle change; you still don't get to cast it uh, from exile um, for free. But I think there's an. I think the games will go long enough in some matchups that you can just play this as a kind of two mana, you know, four four five if you plot it, uh, which is pretty good. Like like that rate is good. So, but that's yeah. I mean, obviously, it on two kind of competes with Smuggler's Copter and Bane Ripper and stuff like that. But um, I think a, a more likely scenario is you plot this on four and hold up a two mana counter spell. And then you untap it on five, you play this as a buff. So, so that's that's where I envision this season a little. So I guess the common thread I'm seeing with all the plot cards is that you use them more for the plot's ability to obtain tempo in some way, more so than the card itself being like, oh, I want to play this whatever the rate of the card is for this plot cost. Right. Yep. Okay. So like obviously spirits would not play a two mana, two, three flyer with no ability, right? Um, and it would likewise not play a five mana, four, five lifelink flyer either. But a hybrid of the two is a lot more reasonable. All right. So moving past Dust Animus, we have 
Eartha Joe, Frontier Mentor. This is another four mana Boros legendary creature. It's a 2-4, Core Advisor. And it says, when it enters the battlefield, you create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token with tap target creature you control gets plus 1, plus 0 until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. Also, notably, uh, there are a ton of cards in this set that have this ability of creating a 1-1 one, one mercenary with the tap pump a guy ability. And then it also says, whenever you activate an ability that targets a creature or player, copy that ability. You may choose new targets for the copy. So it is your panharmonicon for activated targeted abilities. I looked all over the place to see if there was some sort of combo that you could do with this, especially I was wondering if there would be any like blue untapper effects where you could have a creature yeah. with an untap effect that would be like, you know, tap the creature, untap something else. And then Eartha Joe would combo with that creature to untap also the untapper. And then you could go infinite. And it looks like every single untapper creature in Pioneer from like Vizier of Tumbling Sands to everything else are all templated to say another target creature or permanent. Yeah. So you can never target themselves. So as far as I can tell... There is no two-card AB combo with Eartha Joe, in Pioneer at least. So you have to be at least three like three cards, including Eartha Joe, and in another color. So I don't think that is really where you get anywhere with this card, but uh, what did you think? Like, what are you looking to set up with this? Yeah, well, the thing that immediately struck to mind for me was what kind of activated abilities can we target the opponent that deal damage to them? That was, like, kind of where I was looking at. And they actually printed one in the same set that maybe will show up in some capacity. I'm not really holding my fingers. And it's high noon because you can, because on, on turn five, you can sack the high noon and now you hit them for 10, basically. Um, that was like mostly what I was looking at with it is like maybe you play this as some kind of curve topper that has like a, a two mana 10 damage combo. So a red burn deck where you have activated abilities that burn your opponent. Yeah, yeah. Or like a, yeah, there's, there's also uh, my friend Brian won an RCQ, a standard RCQ with, uh, a red white legends aggro deck and like maybe that deck plays you know this type of card anyway um yeah like that that's kind of where i was looking at with this notably it does double all your mercenaries tapping to uh now they they pump twice and there's actually a lot of creatures that make a mercenary there's there's prickly pair that on three makes one and then you can play this you tap immediately um there's another four mana creature that makes two that gives outlaws hey so so there's a i think you can also just like maybe there's some kind of weird mercenary deck that also like you know can can use this kind of as an anthem um uh, but yeah there's no like clean two card combos but uh, but i think you can do some work with it all right this also looks like the kind of card that would be really fun to build around as a commander oh absolutely just figure out like all the best targeted activated abilities that you can put in boros and what to do i'm gonna make a commander deck of this and just see what i can do with it <laughs> All right, so moving off, off of Eartha Joe, we've got Esoteric Duplicator. This is a three mana blue artifact and is also a clue for some reason. Whenever you sacrifice Esoteric Duplicator or another artifact, you may pay two mana. If you do, at the beginning of the next end step, create a token that's a copy of that artifact and then has the clue ability, tap, sacrifice it, draw a card. So this is five mana, draw a card, or seven mana, draw a card, and then you make a copy of it, or you use the duplicating ability to dupe other artifacts. So presumably, this technically, I guess, is a draw engine if you have a sufficient amount of mana to keep sacking and copying it every turn, but pr but presumably you want to use this with other artifacts to also dupe them. So what are you looking to do with it? So there is a combo with this that is Pioneer Legal, and that's with Ugin's Nexus. Um, so on your end step, you sack the Ugin's Nexus. So you need a sack outlet specifically. You need a sack outlet and two mana. Uh, you sack the Ugin's Nexus on your own end step, to take an extra turn, and then it'll come back on the next end step where you can sack it again. Um, now, you can find these cards off of Oswald, which also is a sack thing, value thing with the solder duplicator as well. So Oswald can be a sack outlet for it. Um, and that's kind of a deck I was looking at. Maybe there's a War of Invention angle because War of Invention can find you duplicator, Ugin's Nexus, or a trading post, which is another sack outlet. Uh, so that's kind of what I was looking at with this card. I think that's really the only non-commander application for this type of effect. Obviously, in commander, you have Cart Clan Ironworks, which is pretty good with the Sodder Duplicator. Mm -hmm. uh, but in formats where you don't have Cart Clan Ironworks, I think like maybe Ugin's Nexus um, plus Oswald is like an angle. Uh, is Oswald the only sack outlet? Like, what are the other ones that are good? Trading, trading post, Oni Cult Anvil, uh, Legion Extruder from this set as well. There, there's a there's a good amount. Okay, so. Uh, this strikes me as sort of like cool, but too cumbersome. Like you got to play a bunch of cards that are expensive and don't do anything when they come into play and have a lot of mana set up. Yeah. You probably just play this as like a tutor target for some kind of other deck that has like a complicated, like the Wur prison deck in Pioneer is like a blue white Supreme Verdict. It's Raven Inspector deck. And like, now you can just play Oswald, this Ugin's Nexus and like have access to a combo. Um, yeah. 
I think there's no real like I'm playing this on three in my deck and you know doing things. I think it's just uh, mostly a commander card that sometimes will show up to have like a. Okay, so moving on, we have Fibble Fip Lost on the Range. This is a three mana legendary blue creature. It has double blue pips in its cost, and it is a one one legendary homunculus. It has Ward two. And it says, you may look at the top card of your library anytime. The top card of your library has plot. The plot cost is equal to its mana cost. And you may plot non-land cards from the top of your library. So this is another in the various variants that we've seen of you can play the top card of your library cards. Uh, probably the closest thing to this would be like Reality Chip. In green, it would be like Augur of Autumn. Uh, so there's a couple notable things about it. First of all, it does have Ward, which makes it the most defensible of all of these like cast stuff from the top of your deck cards. Secondly... It does not allow you to play lands. So that is a pretty big downside. So if you hit, if a land is on top of your library, you can't do anything. You're just bricked and Fibblethip stops casting stuff. That being said, it is another in the long line of like around three mana play stuff off the top of your library cards. I'm not sure if the plotting part is too relevant. It does mean that when you do have like your engine going. So there's a lot of times where you have like reality chip or, you know, those other top deck cards and you just have a bunch of mana. And so you can just start casting tons of stuff off the top of your library. This card specifically, you can only plot the cards, which means you can't play them all on the same turn. You have to wait a turn at least. But it seems pretty interesting. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, I think the ward is necessary for a card like this because if you're going to get value off of this and you want to play it on curve, you're taking basically two turns off to like get two cards for free, best case. Um, maybe even only just one card. So like the ward feels like pretty important for this. Um, in Pioneer, notably, there was a lot of people talking about Jace... Uh, reawakened with Valky, because if you manage to plot Valky, you can cast either half. Same with Bramble Familiar, you can cast either half. So maybe there's an angle with that. Um, a card that uh, possibly works well with this is See the Truth as well, because you can plot See the Truth and then cast on the next turn to draw three cards for free. Um, so maybe there, that's like enough of a catch-up um, off of that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of struggle to see what kind of deck can really utilize this, because having to pay for the cards... Like, it's much worse, like, because usually, yeah, you want to play this effect later in the game, like on five, six, seven, you know, when you have more mana available. But then you just don't, you take a whole turn off. So I'm not really sure that this card will see much play. Maybe in uh, something I was thinking about was maybe in the Rona combo with Keenan and stuff. Maybe there's an angle for it there. Uh, maybe there's some kind of Legends deck that wants to play it because you could play it in like an Esper Legends shell, which just pop up from time to time. Um, yeah, it's a weird card. I, I like it. I like cards like this, but you know, <laughs> yeah, not being able to hit lands feels like pretty bad. I think it's it's the cheapest version that's unrestricted. So like reality chip is two mana, and then you have to reconfigure it for three. Uh, Augur of Autumn, you need a bunch of different creature types, and then okay. and then you can only play creatures and lands and not other things. This card is you can play anything, but you can't play lands, and you can't play the cards immediately. You have to plot them. Right. Yeah. Weirdly, it doesn't play well with counter spells and high land counts. So. I don't think it really goes into control decks. Um, this feels like the kind of thing that you play as like a court of calling target or something. Something like that, yeah. All right, so moving on. Final showdown. This is a single white instant, but it actually costs more than that because it's just another spree card. And the spree abilities are one generic for all creatures lose all abilities until end of turn. One mana for choose a creature you control, it gains indestructible until end of turn. And then the most important ability, five mana, including double white, destroy all creatures so probably the mode that this is going to be the most is a six mana instant speed wrath that costs triple white you may also at times make one of your own creatures indestructible so if you're playing like blue white control and you've got a big shark token or something you can make that thing indestructible and then there's also uh, lose it creatures lose abilities so you can make you know creatures that have death triggers or something or are you know indestructible you can make them lose their abilities so you kill them all and they don't get any value you can also play this as not a wrath and you can use it for other things so let's say maybe like i don't know you just need your opponent to lose to have, have their creatures lose their abilities for whatever reason you can play this as a two mana they lose their abilities you can play this as a two mana your creature becomes indestructible effect in i don't know heroic or hammer or something a lot of applications here. Obviously, the one that stands out the most is the Instant Speed Wrath, because the only Instant Speed Wrath we've had until now is Route, which is 7 mana and older and not Pioneer legal. Yeah, we, we have a 7 mana one in Pioneer. That's, like, pretty bad. Um, saw some standard play um, from uh, Born of the Gods or something. Um, yeah, uh, something that I'm interested in with this card is... So I think any Pioneer player who puts Hallowed Moonlight into their deck should be banned from ever playing that format, because that card is awful. Uh... <laughs> Uh, just play this card, like, just play literally fucking basic lands instead. Uh, Hallowed Moonlight is fucking terrible against Phoenix, it's terrible against Amalia, terrible against Vampires, just unplayable magic. 
card. Caveat, this is actually fine against those decks. So it does stop the Amalia combo for two mana, um, which allows you to then untap and play like a temporary lockdown or supreme verdict notably i think unlike uh, like hell of moonlight effects this is actually you know pretty main deckable because drawing a card off your hell of moonlight is much worse than just having an instant speed wrath and so against something like phoenix for example you can just let them put the phoenixes into play and then you make them lose the haste so you don't die and then you can untap and play sunfall or farewell or something that's gonna you know catch them all um, it also can slow down a kill um, by Convoke somewhat because you you can let Imidane's resolve and then make them all lose haste, which doesn't come up a ton, but you know maybe there's some scenario. But I think it's mostly that like white decks now have an answer to Amalia combo because usually when they're Amalia comboing, uh, oftentimes you only need like one more turn to like actually manage to deal with it and stuff. Two mana is kind of a lot. It's kind of what you would pay for a removal spell, but it does have that flexibility. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think the all creatures lose all abilities. Obviously, it's not quite as good as Dress Down because Dress Down being a permanent means that it shuts off, like, uh, ETB effects, which this does not. But it does work against Amalia and Phoenix, at least on, on their, their big turns. So maybe that's enough. So at least in terms of its Wrathing ability, so the main sweepers that Blue White Control plays is Sunfall and Farewell. And Sunfall specifically exiles... Although I don't know how different that is than having the creature lose the ability. I mean, I guess it matters against things that have abilities from the graveyard, like Cauldron Familiar. Return to the ranks and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then Farewell hits more stuff, like more different card yeah. types, not just creatures. So the main question, I guess, would be like for the blue-white control deck that wants to play this as their sweeper, how much of a benefit is the various other modes that you can do that don't just sweep and the fact that it's instant speed versus a sweeper like Sunfall that's cheaper or the sweepers like Sunfall and Farewell that hit more things in Exile. Yeah, I, I, I think the instant speed is huge for that deck. Uh, I generally, I think, and, you know, I've said this for a while, Blue-White Control and Pioneer at least is pretty unplayable. I think that deck is terrible. I think it's also miserable to play against and horrible for the format, um, but also, like, not very good. Um, this is a pretty big up upgrade for that deck. Uh, it does come up that you would want to protect, like, a Sharp Token or something, um, or a Samurai that you've made off a of Wandering Emperor, so that the indestructible will come up sometimes, but I think it's mostly that it's a six mana instant seed sweeper that you can play that also prevents you from losing to you know random nonsense. Um, so yeah. Outside of control, is there any other deck that would want this? Like, does heroic want to have a late game sweeper or something? I, I don't think heroic, but I do think there are other decks. For example, I was trying one in Amalia because giving your Amalia indestructible is relevant. Um, there's also so. You can do some weird nonsense where, like, you make Rampaging Ferocidon lose its ability until end of turn, and then you play your Amalia, um, and then your Wild Growth Walker, and you can, like, you know, figure out from there. Maybe there's some angles there. I think, um, like, decks like Humans and stuff can, like, maybe play it. They don't play Brutal Cathar anymore in Humans, so you don't have to worry about, like, them getting a creature back for removal because you just play Get Lost instead. Yeah, I, I, I think this can go in, in more decks. Um, I'm just not sure exactly where. Notably, you can play it with Gigantha as well. So if there's some kind of like, maybe Pia uh, wants to play one because it's also, it doubles as a protection spell for Pia and a lot of your games kind of are slower post-board. Um, I think it's just pretty flexible. So I would expect to see this definitely in control and maybe in some of the creature decks. Okay, so moving on from here, we have Fomori Vault. This is a land that taps for colorless and then it has three tap discard a card Look at the top X cards of your library, where X is the number of artifacts you control. Put one of those cards into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So this feels like an absolute no-brainer to include in Artifact Matters decks that can afford the colorless slot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to go through them, I guess there's like Metalwork Colossus, Thousand Moon Smithy decks. Yep. I can't really think of too much more outside of that. I doubt a deck like, you know, Affinity would want to play this, but maybe it would. See, I, I would actually play one or two in the either the Blue Red or the Blue White and Soul deck. I would play this as well. Uh, those decks can kind of have a problem flooding, and they usually have. They usually don't have a problem hitting their land drops because of uh, either Inti or um, uh, map tokens. So usually they they can just pitch away lands, find more gas, uh, and usually you want to find like being able to find trapped blasts more stuff like that. Um, so I think you can play one or two in in soul artifact decks. Anything really more to talk about besides that? I mean, like it's a land that it's a land that draws cards. I mean, not really because it discards first, but. 
yeah, we, we've seen other lands like this before, just none that like had as high of ceiling with artifacts, basically. Okay. So on to the next one. We have Forsaken Miner. This is a black 2-2 creature. It's one mana. It's a skeleton rogue. It can't block. And it says, whenever you commit a crime, you can pay a black mana. If you do, return it from your graveyard to the battlefield. I think this is the cheapest version of this effect we've seen so there's like there's a ton of black creatures that are one mana two power creatures that can't block or enter tapped that say like if you attack or if you deal combat damage to your opponent or if you achieve some other condition you can return it although most of those usually cost two mana the only other card that i can think is the most comparable to this is like grave crawler but in pioneer where grave crawler is not legal i believe this is the absolute cheapest version of this effect yes. so it essentially says like once you have committed a so like once you've committed a crime which probably means once you've cast a removal spell kicker black return this from your graveyard yeah it could also be in like rakdos sack and you like witches oven it away and then target something and it comes back any more applications this has besides that uh so it is a rogue and notably rogues is really lacking in playable cheap creatures in pioneer and so both tiny bones and forsaken miner are rogues for that deck uh, to supplement your one drop slot which is kind of what you want uh, thought sees fatal push uh trigger it cling to dust notably graveyard trespasser also commits a card if you target a card in your opponent's graveyard uh so you can like play this and have smugglers copter stuff going on um this doesn't return tapped so it can crew a smugglers copter on defense um and so i think that's mostly where i would be looking at is like rogues uh maybe some sort of black smugglers copter aggro deck I do think a lot of the commit a crime black cards are pretty good. Like Vodmir grows. There's one that's kind of like a Snapcaster mage. So uh, I, I think there's a pretty good angle there for like maybe Graveyard Trespasser stuff, um, which is legal and standard as well. Notably, uh, the bat also targets an opponent. Uh, so you can play bat return this in a post-combat uh, game. So I, I think there's a lot that I, I think it's it's not quite free, but I don't think it's too far off from free to be able to, uh, to commit a crime. So... There's also the dream scenario of the card where you have something that can target over and over and over and you and a sack outlet and you can just keep bringing this back. Oh, sure. Yeah. Go, you know, sack value. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about something like, go. like if you have like Scoos, for example, and a bunch of mana oh, sure. yeah. and then you just go Scoo target yeah. kicker, bring it back, sack it to whatever sack outlet you have yeah. target, bring it yeah. back, sack yeah. it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, moving yeah. off of yeah. Forsaken Miner, we have Fortune Loyal Steed. This is our legendary mount. It is a three mono white creature. It's a two four. It's a beast mount. When it enters, you scry two. And then it has whenever it attacks while saddled, it saddles for one. At end of combat, exile it and up to one creature that saddled it this turn, then return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. So basically, it enters, you scry two. Then you can saddle it with almost anything. And then it attacks, but it does have to survive combat, I guess, in order to blink itself. Yeah. Although the other creature will get blinked regardless. So it blinks and the other creature that saddled it blinks. Although you can saddle with more than one creature, but you can only blink one creature with its ability. One. Yep. And it does have to survive the combat in order to blink itself. So like if your opponent just has a four power creature or something with death touch, they can just kill it and then you can't keep blinking over and over every turn. Um, Card looks decent. Like you also yeah, just get the scry regardless whenever it comes in, which is not nothing. Yeah, it, it, it looks playable to me. I was trying this out in a couple of decks and it was fine. Uh, the scry two was pretty nice. Three minute two four is reasonable uh, stats um you can blink in in pioneer in particular you can blink sky kill evaporation which is pretty reasonable um uh, just kind of get that chain going it's kind of like a weird charming prince type card um not really sure like if any deck really wants this in particular it's also notable that it takes quite a while to actually get going because you play it it can't yes. attack yet and then on turn four you can finally saddle and attack with it yes yeah that's why i was looking at cards like skyclave where you can like take a turn off play this skyclave the thing that blocks this and then blink skyclave their other thing you know sure they get a token whatever um but usually the token is not going to be a four power token so you can like do it again uh stuff like that i mean you can blink whatever like it doesn't have to be some dinky small creature that with an ability you can play like bigger rares that have bigger abilities yeah yeah oh yeah see trying to mm -hmm. <laughs> all right moving off of fortune we have Free Strider Lookout. This is a 3 mana 3-3 three, three with uh, green with Reach. It's a human rogue, and it says, whenever you commit a crime, look at the top five cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them onto the battlefield tapped, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. This ability triggers only once each turn. So basically, uh, every removal spell you have has a Elvish Rejuvenator stapled to it, basically. Every desert land you put into play, tap, that targets the opponent, finds you another land. I think that's why they made it only triggers once each turn so you can just put all so you your can just chain all your ping deserts together and let's kill them yeah um, but still i mean in, in standard that may be enough where you play this play a desert land tapped 
get another land for free. Um, so may maybe there's something to that. It's a weird card. And also, once again, I guess I can point out you can scooze every turn with this. Yes. Yeah. So it's only once each turn. So you can do this on your opponent's turn as well. So you can be like, Free Strider, look out next turn, untap, scooze something, trigger, pass the turn, scooze something, trigger. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's probably good enough. I mean, scooze is just like actually a pretty solid card. At least in, in Pioneer right now. There's got, is there a better ability? Are there like zero mana abilities that you can just target stuff with for free over and over? I can't think of any not of them. Not, crypt, not, not over and over, but you could Dormod's Crypt. <laughs> like the only things that I can think of that are like that are the Cephalid Breakfast combo creatures that are not, not legal outside of Legacy. Uh, Unlicensed Hearse is only once, but like can do it like for free on Curve, I guess. But, you know. I'm trying to think of any nothing. any permanent that has like zero colon target. There's there's nothing like that. It's It's all older cards that are like that. But you can still do some... Like you can still get value off it, you know, off of just like hearse on curve will like still let you ramp on three, which you know, or yeah, obviously scoos will let you do it a couple times. The desert lands also like work reasonably well. So I think there's some stuff. All right, moving on. We have Frontier Seeker. This is a two mana two one white human scout. It is when it enters the battlefield, you look at the top five cards of your library, you may reveal a mount creature or a planes and put it into your hand. And then put the rest on the bottom in a random order. So what do you want to talk about Frontier Seeker? So this is mostly with uh, the legendary mount in the, the Pioneer application, at least, is you can play this in like humans and you can maybe play two copies of, of Fortune or whatever and grab that and you can have like kind of an engine. You don't really want to look for this in standard is mostly where I'm looking at this. And so this is better than like ambitious farmhand effects for the mono white deck because it's almost always going to find it. And that deck pro possibly plays like, you know, fortune anyway. There's a lot of cheap mount slash mount payoff cards. Uh, so maybe there's some kind of mount deck where if you play um, Seraphic Steed, Fortune, or maybe the Caustic Bronco, that's like that's enough hits to pretty reliably turn this into two mana draw a creature, uh, which uh, from there, I guess... The surveil lands are dual lands that are planes, so you could find a mana fixing off of it, though I'm not sure how many would want to play. Um, but there's a lot of cheap mount payoffs, and the mounts are all creatures. So if this is a 2-mana two 2-1 two that finds you a playable creature, that's like a pretty good rate. So I think there's some constructed application there. I want to say personally, I absolutely despise these... Uh... ETB look at the top X effects. So they're on a bunch of things. It's usually five cards. Sometimes it's four. Sometimes it's three. Sometimes it's six. But I hate them for the same. I hate them for the same reason I hate Coco, which is the brick statistics, where sometimes you play them and they just brick and you don't do anything. And you can say, well, you know, you can build your deck around them to include more cards. It's like there, I've played so many times where, you know, you're playing Coco in your 30 creature deck and you Coco into like one thing or nothing and just brick. I've played plenty of like Elvish Rejuvenator. Pioneer ramp decks that have 26 lands in them, and you look at the top five and you don't hit a land, so you just played a three mana one one that does nothing. It feels yeah, I, so I, bad when you brick on them. I think it's different with a card like this where two mana two one is a playable, acceptable rate. Like, um, I think the issue with this is you definitely need to be playing a bunch of mounts because, like, h hitting land drops is fine on these kinds of aggro decks, but if this was like two mana two one draw card, like, that's pretty good in low to the ground aggro decks. Like, yeah, definitely a card like Coco and Rejuvenator. Like, whiffing feels like you lose the game with those cards. With this, if you whiff, I don't really feel like that's the case because, like, it's at least an acceptable card uh, when you whiff. Uh, I would like to see them experiment more with one and two mana cards that kind of do that. Like, Cenote Scout kind of feels like uh, like that to me. A lot of times with Cenote Scout, you want to hit a land on top um, to draw your card, basically. Um, and that's like, and that one doesn't feel as bad when you, like, whiff on the land either when you're for land drops so see i get what they're trying I, to do I, right like they're trying to have a card that says they're trying to have a card that basically says you draw a card but you specifically have to build your deck in a certain way and if the card was like if the card was templated like you know reveal off the top until you find what you're looking for and you hit it every time then you wouldn't have to build your deck a specific way but just yeah whenever you build these kinds of decks even if you build them around having enough cards in your deck to trigger these things there's still usually a like one in ten or one in eight chance that you whiff on them and when you're playing enough games, you will whiff on them, and it feels so horrible to, okay, well, now I just basically lose the game on the spot because I paid four mana for a Coco that did nothing. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. I, I like the design of this card and, like, Militia Bugler and stuff more, where even when they whiff, it doesn't feel as bad because it's not like you just lose the game for playing them whiff, right? Okay. Like, like, that's the problem with, like, Coco, right? It's like, you, you feel like the the winner loss is variance off of the whiff or not. But a card like this, a, a bit less so. Same with, like, if you activate a recruitment officer on a, on, on a turn and you, you fail to find a card, you know, or you only find one creature off Knight Errands. Um, 
Like, I think having the variance like that is really good for the game, and it's really good for gameplay, but less like Coco and more like this, basically. Is. Where, you, where you at least get a minimum floor of value. Yeah, yeah. Like, this 2-minute two 2-1 two is acceptable, uh, so it doesn't feel as bad uh, to whiff on a card like this. But whiffing on Coco, you just lose, basically, right? <laughs> yeah. So. All right, so moving on. We have Geralt the Flesh Right. This is a 3-mana blue 2-3 Legendary Human Warlock. And it says, whenever you cast a spell during your turn, other than your first spell that turn, create a 2-2 blue and black zombie rogue creature token. So whenever you cast your second, third, fourth spell, you make a 2-2. And whenever a zombie enters the battlefield under your control, you put a plus one counter on it for each other zombie that entered the battlefield under your control this turn. So basically, depending on how many spells you can chain back to back, the second makes a 2-2, the third makes a 3-3, the fourth makes a 4-4, etc. What do you think of Geralt? Yeah, I'm currently trying in a bunch of decks. Uh, I know it's not quite the same as Young Pyromancer in a deck like Phoenix, but it's reasonably close. This also works incredibly well with plot. So you can plot a card on two and then play this on three and immediately cast it. And you've kind of recouped the time you took off from plotting because you've made a 2-2 off of it. Uh, so I, 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 I am quite excited to jam this in decks and see. Maybe it's mostly a sideboard card, but... Uh, I, I don't think it requires a ton of work. Like, if you make one 2-2, two, two, it's fine. Uh, if you ever get to make two creatures in one turn, um, obviously that's, like, pretty bananas. Um, but, yeah. Uh, so I, 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 I think we're going to see this more in Pioneer, where you can plot cards on two uh, and then play it, or where you have enough density of one mana cantrips where you can play this on three. If you ever on top with it, you're going to make a bunch of tokens. Um, not really sure it's standard playable, and three. I think cards like this don't really make it in other formats very much. Okay. So we do have, there is a standard deck that plays Monastery Mentor and Helping Hand, and you can Helping Hand this back on a turn and then cast a spell. Um, so maybe the Helping Hand deck now has more Monastery Mentors. So. Or I guess unearth this in older formats. Yes, yes, yeah. All right, moving on. We've got Getaway Glamour. This is another Spree card. So it's a single white instant, and it has Spree with a generic mana to exile target non-token creature, return it to the battlefield under its own control at the beginning of the next end step, or two mana, destroy target creature if no other creature has greater power. So it's two mana to blink a non-token creature, or to flicker a non-token creature, three mana to destroy the highest power creature on the battlefield, as long as it's not equal to another creature's power, or four mana to do both. Yep. Take it away. So this is basically like touch the spirit realm. Uh, can't hit artifacts but or, or tokens, but uh, it's kind of the closest analog. Um, and I think this fits, I think this is overall better because even though while you can't blink tokens for two mana, uh, on four mana, you can blink a blocker and kill another block, uh, which should come up um, a good amount. So I think it's just a slightly better touch the spirit realm for some decks. Is uh, it mostly? So Although it doesn't usually touch the spirit realm show up often because you're trying to do something like Cascade, where you want that effect on, on a cheaper amount of mana? Uh, in Pioneer, we've been seeing it just more random. Like, um, the Enigmatic decks played it for a bit. Or, or because it's an enchantment. Like, that's another thing. Yeah, because it's an enchantment, yeah. We have been seeing it in, so, like, for example, Metalwork Colossus played Touch the Spirit Realm in Pioneer. Uh, some of the slower decks just, just played it because it was kind of flexible. Um, but I think the difference with this is... This fits more into the aggro decks where we haven't really seen anything for three or four mana that's quite like this in Pioneer. And notably, this can remove two creatures uh, in mono, in like mono white, basically, which isn't really something that we've seen proactive. So I think, yeah, like, well, for example, humans uh, wouldn't want to play uh, Touch the Spirit Realm. Maybe they'll play this. All right. Next card up is Gired. Gired? Mirror of the Wilds. This is a three mana Naya creature, so red, green, and white. It's a 3-3 three, three legendary human shaman. It has haste, and it says non-token creatures you control have tap, create a token that's a copy of target token you control that entered the battlefield this turn. So your non-token creatures have the ability to tap to create copies of any token if the token entered this turn. Yep. Not really sure what you do with this, although once again, it seems like a really interesting commander to build around. It's really cool. Um, two immediate cards that come to mind so there is a combo with this but before i get to that two immediate cards that come to mind are fable the mirror breaker and a chariot where they're going to make a token or mirror x i guess as well anything that's going to make a token like every turn uh can really snowball out of control with this you do need enough non-creatures but um maybe there's something there um so the notable part of this is that it itself can of course tap to use its ability but it also because you can only copy something that entered that means you have to either have enough mana to play something else aside from Gearhead, or you need like a plot card that is going to make something for free. 
Right. So something too is like Skrelv's Hive. Um, this can clone a, a token of a Skrelv's Hive immediately on the on the turn that you play Gearhead because you play Skrelv's Hive on two on turn three. You make a, a Might, and then you can play this. And you can copy the Might, and you know. To, so there's like some kind of ways uh, to do that kind of effect. Uh, there is a combo with it that is I be, that is standard legal, and you use Dominating Vampire and Blade of Shared Souls. And you can like chain that together. Dominating Vampire will untap, uh, untap Gear Ed, and then you you make it because when the Blade of Shared Souls comes into play, it makes a token, right? And the token becomes a copy of, say, your Dominating Vampire. So Gear Ed can copy the Dominating Vampire, um, which will then untap the Gear Ed, and then from there, you gotta like you know do some shit. You know, so three three card splinter twin basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have seen decks like that see some amount of success in standard. Uh, it does help that the cards are all, you can find them all off of Kayla's Reconstruction. Uh, so it, it, it's reasonable enough that there that someone will at least 5-0 in some capacity. So, yeah. All right, moving on from Girid, we've got Gisa the Hellraiser, five mana black creature. It's a 4-4 human warlock. It has ward two plus pay two life. Skeletons and zombies you control get plus one, plus one, and have menace. And whenever you commit a crime, create two tapped 2-2 two, two blue and black zombie rogue creature tokens. This ability triggers only once each turn. So all of your ping deserts, all of your removal spells have get two two bears attached to them. Well, and if Geese is still sticking around, two three threes. Yeah. Where do you where are you looking to play this? So I had immediately started looking. There is a black zombies deck in Pioneer that periodically pops up. And they do often they do sometimes play Liliana's Mastery. Um I think Gisa's overall better. Ward two mana and pay two life is actually like a pretty relevant amount. It's not necessarily guaranteed that she will die. Um, but in standard, you could play her. There's a, there's a lot of the black cards, the mono black cards that like have good commit a crime effects. Vodmir, Forsaken Miner, Gisa, stuff like that. And you can actually trigger her on curve in both standard and pioneer if you have a graveyard trespasser in play. And that's like what I'm most interested in because you can attack with the trespasser, target a card in their graveyard. And you just make the two twos immediately. Or on licensed Taurus or like any or of those other effects. Turrets. Yeah. Yep. Yes. So that's kind of like where I'd be looking at with her. And obviously, if you can make two, if you can trigger her the first turn you play her, that's really good. Um, so that's kind of where I would look at is like Graveyard Trespasser, uh, Bat, and removal spells will also, you know, I think there's a lot of ways to commit a crime in standard. Uh, so yeah, so that's mostly it. Graveyard Trespasser is kind of what I'm looking at. Gisa is also another one of these cards that's like many of the cards in the set where it's like, Outlaws of Thunder Junction, Cowboys, Guns, Mounts, a random card from Innistrad that wandered into the set somehow. Yeah, Omen Paths, man. Okay, moving on from Gisa, we've got Grand Abolisher. So obviously Grand Abolisher is not a new card, but it is being reprinted here, which makes it Pioneer legal. So it is a two mana, double white, two, two human cleric. And it says during your turn, your opponents can't cast spells or activate abilities of artifacts, creatures, or enchantments. So that ability is essentially silence, although it's not 100% silence because your opponent can still interact with you with certain things, like they can channel Odawara, for example. But yeah, it's it's mostly silence. So where Grand Abolisher shows up, I believe silence is legal in Pioneer, right? Yes. So where Grand Abolisher tends to show up is in combo-centric or synergy-centric decks where having a creature matters more than the cheaper silence, either because the deck is aggressive and you want to just have a creature as a body that matters more than having the silence be one mana cheaper, or because the car because it's in a deck like Amalia where you've got cards like Court of Calling that can tutor it. So yep. I would imagine this would show up in Amalia immediately. And if Grease if Amalia ever goes away and Grease Fang comes back, probably it'll see playing Grease Fang, maybe, I don't know. Uh yeah, it could be. If there's a humans yeah, I, deck or there's some kind of white aggro deck that wants this effect for whatever reason, it could show up there. Heroic, it's probably a perfectly fine card to have. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think Heroic is actually like where I'd be looking at. It does clash with Gigantha, but it is like kind of an effect that they're looking for. Um, notably, it doesn't stop uh, Carnosaur. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop any of the uh, channel cards. Yeah, so it, it's not quite as like much of a lock as it used to be uh, back when it was last time in standard. Um, yeah, maybe Amalia plays it as well. They currently don't always play Voice of Resurgence, but often enough they do. And Voice is close to your opponent can't play spells because if you have uh, a Voice in play and a Soul Sister effect and you go for the combo, if they cast a spell, you just make a token response go for the combo. So Grand Abolisher and Voice kind of are the same card in, the, in that regard. Um, yeah, you definitely need to be a deck that is fine with two twos that values the creature in order to to really want to play this 
Um, maybe humans plays it in some capacity. Uh, notably, it's weird against Wandering Emperor in that it's good against Wandering Emperor if you already have this in play. But if you cast this and they cast Wandering Emperor in response, they can still activate the uh, the Wandering Emperor because Grand Abolisher doesn't affect Planeswalkers, um, which I, I guess may may come up. Also, notably, it doesn't prevent them from uh, activating Castle Ardenvale to make a blocker or activating a, a creature land to block as well. Um, so it's probably better in decks like Grease Fang and Amalia. So. All right. Moving on, we've got Great Great Train Heist. This is another Spree card, so it's a single red mana, and it's an instant. And the Spree modes are two and a red, untap all creatures you control. If it's your combat phase, there's an additional combat phase. Plus two, or uh, two mana, creatures you control get plus one, plus zero, and gain first strike. And a single red mana, choose target opponent. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to that player this turn, create a tapped treasure. So... Four mana to get extra combat step and untap all your guys. Three mana to pump your guys by one power and first strike. Two mana to make all of your guys hitting them uh, create tap treasures. And then any additional amount of mana to get multiple modes. So why do you want to talk about Great Train Heist? So I had mentioned before that I played a young Pyromancer Storm deck that I actually think is like pretty reasonable uh, in Pioneer. And this card is like perfect for that. But it's also possible that like Convoke plays this in some capacity. Um, Because you untap all your guys regardless of the extra combat. Right, right. Um, So, like, maybe there's some kind of decks like that. Uh, I'm not really sure it should really show up outside of that. The thing with with Convoke 2 is, like, you can use all the other modes as well. But I think it's just, it's just mostly, it's a, like, pretty unique card in Pioneer. And it plays pretty well with Young Pyromancer, plus, like, Stoke the Flames. So that's, like, mostly what I was looking at with it. I guess one other thing I should mention with all of these spree cards, like Great Train Heist and Final Showdown, is because they are cheap instants in these colors, because they're one mana, you can get them off of Micromancer, yes. and you can also get them off of Sunforger, although you do still have to pay for the additional modes on them. But that's yeah. just like another thing worth mentioning. Yeah, my, the Micromancer one is going to show up in my Pioneer Cube quite a bit. So you can Micromancer for a, a sweeper, basically, where you could never do that before. Yep. Anyway, moving on, we've got High Noon, the new best rule of law. It is a two mana white enchantment, and it says each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. It also has, for some reason, five mana, including a red pip. Sack it, deal five damage to any target. So the cheapest rule of law effects that we've seen are there's deafening silence at one mana, which only hits non-creature spells, which is usually good enough, but there are times when the creature spells matter. And then the only other card that's at two mana that has the same effect is Aethersworn Canonist, but Aethersworn Canonist has the downsides of it doesn't affect artifacts, and it itself is a 2-2 artifact creature and therefore dies to a lot more removal spells than High Noon does. As far as the enchantment rule of laws that say you can't play additional cards, this is the cheapest version of them that that doesn't have any restrictions, and it is also an enchantment and not a creature. And then randomly, it's got the deal five, so sometimes that'll also just kill your opponent. So this seems like it's going to be an auto in and like any deck that wanted to run enchantment rule of law effects before is going to want this. It's going to immediately get slotted into every single white stacks EDH deck. I don't really think there's any much more to say about it than that. I mean, you can get it back with Lurus. <laughs> is there like any other application that I'm missing? Like, I, you know, the, the deal five is not irrelevant. So no, I mean, a, a deck where I was playing this in one of the in some of the early pioneer testing has been like Boros Burn, for example, where like that deck is fine playing one spell on its turn, one spell on the opponent's turn, and you know rule of three mana for was too much, and so like you know maybe you play this and then deal five actually is relevant for that deck. Um, yeah, I think it's it's just a rule of law that's slightly cheaper and sometimes has an extra effect. Like there's nothing like particularly nuanced about the card other than i did mention that creature that doubles that panharmonicons things that target a creature or player activated abilities you can play high noon on curve and sack high 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 noon on five and deal 10 to them so maybe maybe there's some weird meme thing with that all right moving on from high noon highway robbery this is a two mana red spell that you can plot for two it's a sorcery and it says you may discard a card or sack a land if you do draw two so it is another in the line of various tormenting voice variants that is way better than tormenting voice yes uh tell me about highway robbery uh i think this is not close to the best tormenting voice effect we've ever seen i think this card is really good uh it plays pretty well with Jeralf on three you just plot this on two play Jeralf, play highway robbery you know you've got a sauce going but i'm actually playing this in phoenix right now as like a two to three of um like so so it's a discard outlet you also if you don't want to discard can sack lands and and because you can plot it you can double spell way more easily yes yeah the idea is there's a lot because phoenix is such a land light deck 
but you're also a ledger shredder deck, there's a lot of games where you just have to run a ledger shredder out on two. And with Highway Robbery, instead, you can plot to set up on three. And something that was noticeably lacking in Phoenix was on turn three, you had basically no way to put a Phoenix into play because your discard outlets are usually Ledger Shredder or Lightning Axe. So you ha your opponent has to have a creature for you to target. Um, so if you play a Ledger Shredder and then they kill it, sometimes there's just no target. But if you plot Highway Robbery on turn three, you can go Cantrip, Cantrip, um, Cantrip, I guess, Highway Robbery. So it does allow you to put a Phoenix into play off of just two lands on turn three, um, which is pretty unique and probably powerful in the deck but also it lets you go plot on two and then when you still only have two lands play ledger shredder immediately cast this connive and then you're probably going to find a land from there so i think it slots pretty well uh into phoenix at least as a two to three of uh, also relevant is uh phoenix gets forced into low resource games a lot where you're out is you need to cast a draw spell and then you need to be able to cast a lightning axe um while you're in top deck mode um so currently if you're chaining cantrips you're never going to be able to cast a lightning axe for a spell so it does limit your outs but if you're a draw spell when you're flooded in top deck mode low, like no cards in hand is highway robbery you can just sack a land and then you can go up on cards and if you draw a lightning axe you can still like go cantrip lightning axe but phoenix is in play so i think it slots pretty perfect into phoenix um it, it may also slot into uh decks that play like some prowess creatures i think pia wants to play some number of this because one of the problems with pia is reckless impulse and ren's resolve are really good cards just not on turn two mm -hmm. they're really really bad on turn two if you don't hit a, a land off of them uh, so usually you don't want to reckless impulse or ren's resolve on turn two in, in pia but you would much rather plot highway robbery and then uh, set up on a future turn so yeah i, I, I also you're casting it from exile so it triggers pia Yes. So it triggers P. Exactly. Yes. Yep. So I, I like this card a lot. Is this secretly one of the best cards in the set? Probably. <laughs> All right. Weird, but, but probably. Moving on, we've got Honest Rutstein. So this is a three mana black and uh, green creature. It is a 3-2 human warlock legend. And it says, when it enters the battlefield, you return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. And creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. So... I believe this is the cheapest Gravedigger we've ever seen that also has better stats and a cost reduction mode on it. Yeah, so we have had Gloom Shrieker, but Gloom Shrieker exiles itself, which is actually really relevant in Gravedigger cards because you want to be able to get another copy, worst case. Um, yeah, no, on Honest Red Steam is really good. Uh, I was actually looking at slotting this into Amalia pretty immediately because I think it's better overall than the second Extraction Specialist and the cost reduction actually matters in that deck. Uh, being a legend randomly to reduce Takanumas and Besejus also is like pretty relevant, but I I was very surprised to see this type of card printed because yeah, it's a grave digger that also has more upside is uh, particularly common. Probably probably a good thing though, right? Because grave diggers sucks. Yes, yes, but it's just like they usually try to make them four mana grave digger with upside, but it, at four mana it's just like untenable. But at three mana you can play a lot more like utility creatures. So. All right, moving on. We have Insatiable Avarice, another spree card. It's a single black mana sorcery, and it sprees for two generic. Search your library for a card, then shuffle and put that card on top. And spree for double black. Target player draws three and loses three. So, uh, first of all, this makes Entomb legal in Pioneer. Or, or sorry, not Entomb. Um, top deck tutors, Imperial Seal, basically, although yeah. it's more expensive. Uh, so, previously, we didn't have a good way to put anything on the top of the deck. The best we had was uh, the symmetrical card. I forget what it's called. Scheming Symmetry. Scheming Symmetry, but that also gave your opponent the tutor. This only gives you the tutor. And there are some cards that care about a card being on top of your deck. And then it also just has a, a lose three, draw three, which we have seen on a number of cards before. And I don't think any of those cards have ever been playable. So, but maybe it's... Painful Truth sees a uh, playing Amalia right now. Okay. Yeah. So it's like basically the same thing as that, but since it targets, it can also be a last minute... Uh, burn spell but it also has the top deck tutor mode i'm not exactly sure where this goes or if it like spawns its own entire deck yeah what what i was mostly looking at for it was actually playing it in the black green spelunking scapeshift deck uh, that deck wants more ways to just find scapeshift and spelunking um and this can find them like that's fine like that deck is probably fine playing three mana uh slow tutor um, but also because you play Spelunking and a bunch of lands, you can also just do straight up do both modes sometimes. You value drawing cards. So that was a deck where I was looking at uh, playing this. There's also the, I think it's from March of the Machine. There's the three mana blue creature that becomes a copy of whatever's on top of your deck. Yeah. Which occasionally showed up in uh, Show and Tell, although I've tried it there. It's not very good there. But 
the problem was previously, so I believe that card's Pioneer legal, and the previously the problem was there was just no good way to set up the top of your deck, but now there is. So you can go like turn three, blue guy, turn four, put something on top of your deck, go to combat, become a copy of insert giant bomb here attack. Yeah, so I recently, let's see. So last week I was also playing a weird Pioneer brew as well, where I was using a, like Mastery of the Unseen and stuff, and you could like cloak some stuff into play and then blink it with like Yorian and, and things like that. Uh, but I, I don't imagine that deck would want to play uh, anything like that. So for those, so I brought the card up for those who need to know. It's called Vesuvan Drifter, and it's from yes, uh, yeah. March of the Machine Aftermath. It's a three mana blue two yeah. four flyer. You may look at the top card, and at the beginning of each combat, you reveal the top card. If it, you reveal a creature, it becomes a copy of the card, except it has flying. So in modern, you you know you just make it Emrakul and then attack an Annihilator six. In although it's, this is probably too bad of a combo for modern. So in Pioneer, I'm not sure what the best creature you can copy with it is, but if there's anything that has like an attack trigger or just becomes gigantic. Yeah, I don't think there's anything that will just kill the opponents. And the attack triggers are kind. There's no. Like, what about? Isn't there a vanilla 18 power creature? Yargle, yes. Yeah. The, uh, the other one, I think, um, is it Bane of Balagad? That one annihilates um, essentially for two. Yeah, Annihilator two, which is like fine um it's not a ton else but yeah I mean, maybe it's just some meme yargle deck or something so yeah, yeah yargle is the biggest one at 18 yeah. which which unfortunately alone does not guarantee that your opponent gets killed right a lot of decks are gonna have to shock but not always so i just don't think there's there's probably just not a good combo that exists at the moment with this yeah but it's worth keeping it keeping in mind of like all right this pairs with vesuvian drifter yeah, I, I think I would be more interested if there was like some form of redundancy, like something else that put into play from the top. And there is a card from the set that is five mana, um, top three cards. Uh, you, you plot one of them, but like it's a sorcery and that's a lot of mana to set up and stuff. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to Jace Reawakened. It's a double blue legendary planeswalker. It starts with three loyalty, and it says you can't cast the spell during your first, second, or third turns of the game, so it's got the Sarah Avenger text. The abilities are plus one loyalty, draw a card, discard. Plus one loyalty, you may exile a non-land card with mana value three or less from your hand. If you do, it becomes plotted. And minus six until end of turn, whenever you cast a spell, copy it. You may choose new targets for the copy. So obviously, planeswalkers, you don't evaluate them based on their ultimates, so you have to evaluate it based on the first two abilities. The main thing that people look at this for is that, of course, you can... Uh, you can plot Valky, right? And then... Or Bramble Familiar. Yeah, it's like any any of these like splits or cards that have two different things on them that are technically only one mana value and then cast it. Mm -hmm. Although it becomes plotted, so it's not like you get to Valky immediately. You do have to wait right. a turn. You have to wait a turn, yeah. Uh, there's also the issue of like you're playing a double blue spell in a Valky deck, which is usually... Valky decks are usually like BTL decks, and they might not necessarily yeah. have double blue around. There's also the, the having to delay waiting on this card. So a bunch of people brought up, like, you can play Ley Line of Anticipation and then flash <laughs> the set. It's like, this is terrible. Don't do that. It's terrible. Yeah, uh, it sucks. Yeah. The other thing with it is, if you're not looking to do, like, busted Valky stuff with it, you could potentially use it as, if you're, like, turn four in a control deck, you can play Jace and still hold up, you know, Dovin's Veto or some other counterspell, get lost, etc. Although it is awkward that it gets hit by temp lockdown. Yes. So I'm not sure. So I'm not sure exactly where this goes, but it seems powerful enough to show up somewhere. So something that I was mentioning to someone is so I think a good sequence with this is play it on four, hold up a two mana spell, plot away Narset, and then you can play Narset Days Undoing on five. Um, and it's a, a lot more reasonable than Narset Days Undoing when you get to immediately hold up mana to then prevent your opponent's one card from ever doing anything. Currently, there is a blue-black control deck in Pioneer that plays Narset. Usually, they don't bother playing Days Undoing. Maybe with Jace, there's enough reason you can play Valky in that deck as well. Other things that could make Jace playable in that archetype as well. You do have other redundancy with Valky. You can play Release to the Winds, which is fine with Valky. Not great, but fine. Um, and you could play See the Truth as well, which also works well with Jace. Um, uh, there, you could also play it in weird combo decks where kind of use it for a free spell on turn five. Notably, I'm going to be playing it with Invasion of Segovia, so you can play Jace, plot away Invasion of Segovia, and then on the, on turn five, you just cast Segovia, use your mana, win the game. Uh, because one of the problems with Invasion of Segovia is like, if you play it on three or four, oftentimes that's all your mana, so you don't get to like ensure that you get to flip it. But if you play it for free, you can. Um, maybe there's like... I was saying maybe there's some version of Phoenix that wants to play this in the sideboard. It is, it is a discard outlet for Phoenix, but you can also just use it as a free spell um, on a future turn. But I don't know. I, I think people are probably a little overhyping the Valky interaction with Chase, but uh, I think that it's kind of flexible 
with the with the plotting like there's a lot of decks that don't really run out of cards in magic currently and so being able to just do more things is maybe good enough so I don't know. all right so moving on from jace we have karavek the punisher this is a three mana legendary black creature with double black pips it's a three three human warlock and it says whenever you commit a crime exile up to one target black card from your graveyard and copy it you may cast the copy if you do you lose two life so in a black deck, all of your thought seizes and removal spells and whatnot allow you to then also cast another thing from your graveyard. And I believe if that thing also is a targeted spell, then you get to commit a crime again. So you can like chain stuff yep. together. Yep. Not exactly sure what you use this for other than just being like a generic value card in a black deck with targeted spells. That's a... <laughs> Yeah, I think it's just a solid black creature that fits into some of the slower decks. Uh, Bat, thought seize, fatal push removal spells graveyard trust I mean, there's a lot of ways in black to commit a crime uh and a lot of black cards you, you'll want to recast back also the uh, card doesn't have to be mono black you can like recast molten collapse or other stuff cards. yep yep colligan's command is maybe one that will come up and the colligan's uh, command lets you fish carvec out of your graveyard yes yeah I, i'm not sure that it's worth not playing gigantha to play this in a mayhem devil deck uh but maybe there's something there but but yeah, it's just a generically like. Solid well, that card. seems kind of gross. Like, if you have a devil in play and Carvec, you go, you know, deadly dispute, trigger, target a thing, make a treasure, deadly dispute, resolve, sack the treasure, target a thing, get deadly dispute deadly back from your graveyard, yeah. cast it again. Yeah, I mean, usually Rakdos Sack doesn't have a problem winning when they have a Mayhem Devil, so, but maybe Carvec like can also be a way to get a Mayhem Devil back or something. Or yeah, maybe deadly dispute plus like Thought Seize and Fatal Push because the deck plays like four Thought Seize and Fatal Push. So even if you don't have a Devil, maybe you have enough ways. Um, something that I was looking at for standard is this is a legendary creature. Um, so it does make like Takanubas and Ottawaras cost less. And Ottawara will also commit a crime. And that comes up with um, the blue black, like mid rangey deck. Maybe you play this in some capacity. If they kill your bat, you, you can get bats back, which then chains another card. So I think Ker Kervik is like deceptive in that it's not really a three drop. Like you don't play this on three, do nothing past the turn. Right. It's more like a five drop, I think. All right. So we're not sure exactly yeah. where this goes, but it's powerful enough again to be worth testing. Mm hmm. So moving on, we've got Campbell, Profiteering Mayor. This is three mono legendary white and black creature. It's a 2-4 human advisor. It says whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your opponent's control, for each of them, create a tapped token that's a copy of it. This ability triggers only once each turn. And then whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life and, ga and you gain one life. So obviously this is awesome against Dockside. Other than that, I'm not really sure what you do with it. Uh, it's probably fine against Fable the Mirror Breaker. So you create your own Goblin Shaman and drain them. Yeah. Or, I think the problem is like, how do you ensure that your opponent is playing tokens is the problem. Yeah, yeah. I, again, like, I think at least in Pioneer, you can safely assume that your opponent is probably playing a Fable the Mirror Breaker deck. Or it, like, this card is maybe like fine to bring in against the Fable the Mirror Breaker decks. Like, also copying a Blood Token off a of Blood Tithe is fine. Three minute two four is not like terrible, but. It's just kind of like, you know, I, I would like it to do a little more. Um, there's not really any black-white decks currently that tokens into play that matters. Because, like, if you're Grease Fanging, it doesn't care that you drain them for two, right? Mm -hmm. Off of the, the Parhelion tokens you made. So I'm not sure. Even CEDH against Dockside Extortionist, like, if your opponent is creating a sufficient number of treasures to the point where you're draining them for a bunch, they're probably just winning the game on the spot. Like if they're making six to eight treasures and then you draining them for six to eight life is all basically irrelevant. Yes. So I wish this card made your opponent's tokens enter tapped. So the card seems like just ex so narrow that it's not viable. Yeah. The only other thing I can think is yeah. like you have your own effects that create tokens under your opponent's control. So like the card that comes to mind is like Forbidden Orchard, but that just seems so bad. It's so still just fine even if the tokens come into play under your control because you still are draining, I guess. So like, but... Then you need to have a deck that's playing just a ridiculous amount of tokens. Yeah. Yep. All right. So moving on from Campbell, we've got Kellon joins up. So this is a three mana Bant enchantment. It is uh, green, white, and blue. Legendary enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you may exile a non-land card with mana value three or less from your hand. If you do, it becomes plotted. So it's the Jace ability again. You can use it with Valky, etc. We've already talked about that. The second part is whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, you put a plus one counter on each creature you control. So Valky shenanigans aside, which is uh, all five colors. It, I guess, is also a three mana enchantment and is therefore enigmaticable. And you can play it with Giganta. Yeah. Like Jace. And then there's the plus one counter mode, which seems like if you are running a sufficient number of legendary creatures, that ability just basically wins the game, right? Yes. And 
it kind of so that's kind of what i was looking at was you may see some kind of like weird like joda legends aggro deck or something like that where like it feels weird to take turn three off but you make up for it on turn four when you play like the free spell you plotted plus another legend plus another legend and then the game is over right like your creatures are just too big at that point so um we've seen like rafine centric legends creatures decks before mm -hmm. that are running plaza of heroes and all that stuff or rona combo yep. Yep. So not really sure what you do with this, but seems again very, very powerful. Can yes. Potentially yeah, lead I, to I, its I, own I, deck or slot into some yeah. kind of Legends deck. Yeah, it probably makes its own archetype would be my guess. All right, moving on from Kalan joins up. We've got Kalan the Kid. Same exact cost. It is a Bant 3 drop. 3-3 three, three, legendary human fairy rogue with flying and lifelink. And it says, whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand, you may cast a permanent spell with equal or lesser mana value from your hand without paying its mana cost. If you don't, you can put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. So once again, this is the third card that we've seen that can cast Valky. And other than that, it's basically all of your plot spells, all of your adventure spells, and all of your casting things from other zones besides your hand spells allow you to then free cast other permanents from your hand as long as their value is equal or less than whatever it is that you're casting. So no show and tellish cheatiness here besides Valky, but more just like super tempo plays. And the creature is also decently statted, 3-3 Flying Lifelink. Yeah, yeah, the, the stats are fine. Yeah, I don't think this actually works with Valky because you can only cast the creature part off of it because um, it doesn't say cast the card. Uh, so it doesn't even work with that, but like... Does it not? You, not may really... cast, you may cast a permanent spell with equal or lesser mana yeah. value from your hand. Permanent spell, not card. So, and yeah, so it, it, it doesn't work with, uh, with Valky. It's kind of the same wording with like Discover, basically, but... I don't really know where this card is supposed to go, to be honest. Multicolor human aggro? I guess, but you also need to be able to cast things outside of your hand. There are also, there are also, um, there's various spells that make it that instead of you drawing cards, you exile cards and then cast them from exile. Although yes. that basically blanks out the permanent from your hand part of this. So I'm not really sure. And they're usually red <laughs> as well. Yes. Um, so it's, it's a weird card. I, I think where this may, where I may actually play this. Um, and I, I remember now when I when I saw this card, I didn't make it on my deck dump, but it was already 40 decks, so that was like too many Pioneer decks already, um, is I have played the Edgewell Innkeeper Pioneer Adventure decks before, and that deck may want this card. Uh, the last time I played it, it was Naya, but he I think Kellen is enough of a payoff to like, you know, potentially be four colors or just like be Mant or whatever. Um, so I, I could see there with like some adventure creatures. Edgewell Innkeeper is going to ensure you have enough... Uh, cards your whole deck is permanence you do want to put more lands into play as well so you can like chain more things so may maybe that's like a home for it as well is with adventure creatures all right yeah. moving on from kellon we've got Chrom violent cacophony this is a four mana blue and red legend it's a two three zombie horror with flying and it says when you cast your second spell each turn put a plus one counter on Chrom and draw a card so dylan as the resident phoenix player here does Chrom have a one shot <laughs> <laughs> yeah um no, I think if there's a home for this, it's possibly in standard, like plotting and then playing this, triggering it immediately. But I think it's just too too expensive and slow for, for Phoenix. And that if you were ever playing this card, it's like basically this card's the Crackling Drake slot? Yes. And honestly, if I wanted this effect of casting second spell each turn, uh, the draw card is really the more appealing part. You can play the card from, is it Oath of the Gatewatch, the three mana creature? Jurian. Jurian or something. Like, yeah. And I think that's a little better, which... Phoenix players have experimented with playing that type of effect before. Um, but yeah, I think just at four mana, it's just a little too much. All right. It does grow. Yeah. Moving from Chrom, we've got Lava Spur Boots. This is a one mana equipment, and it is equipped creature gets plus one, plus zero, and has haste and ward one, and it equips for one. And the reason this is here is because this is now an auto include in every single Urza Saga deck. Yeah, it seems pretty good there. Uh, in particular, it gives haste to your construct tokens, to your yep. primeval titans, and it's basically just like, hey, did you want to fetch a thing uh, with Arza Saga? Well, here you go. Not really much more to say about it besides that. Yeah, I, I almost included this in the Pioneer Hammer deck, but like that deck plays Rabbit Battery instead because Rabbit Battery is a creature. So. Before we move on, I should point out, like I, we kind of just went through that really quickly. This card is really good in Urza Saga decks. It's just that it's so obviously good there, and there's not really much else to yeah. say about it. Yep. All right, moving on. We've got Legion Extruder. This is a two mana red artifact, and it says when it enters, it deals two damage to any target, and then it has two tap sack another artifact to create a 3 3 golem creature. So it is a sack outlet for artifacts that produces three threes and also ETBs for two damage. So rather than 
So it's kind of like Bone Crusher Giant, where you get a two damage effect and then you get another thing, but rather than getting a four three Bone Crusher, you get a sack outlet that just keeps pumping three threes out over and over. Yeah. Now, notably, it can't sack itself, so you do have to have something else on curve with it, but it is. We haven't really seen very many artifacts that just deal damage to any target before. Um, and there currently is a red artifact deck in Pioneer that plays that ends up with a bunch of random tokens as well that you can end up sacking the uh, the Shrapnel Blast and Soul Artifact deck. Extra reach is nice there, some more creatures. Maybe there's a version of playing this with Oni Cult Anvil. Doesn't it just keep making a 3-3 every single turn with Oni Cult? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I mean like so like you know, may, maybe there's something like going on there with that kind of nonsense. Um it, yeah, it, I think like being able to hit any target is really important because it means you can play it alongside like uh like uh what is it the the one one that makes a map the siren and like so now it just supports the aggressive plans a little more there's that one there's um epicure there's a bunch of you know make yeah, a make epicure a token well. guys yep. yep yep and the extra reach is like pretty nice there so yep. all right moving on from legion extruder we've got lila undefeated slick shot this is a three mana blue and red three three legend human rogue it has prowess and it has whenever you cast a multicolored instant or sorcery from your hand exile the spell instead of putting it into your graveyard as it resolves if you do it becomes plotted so you resolve the spell as normal but then it becomes plotted and you get to cast it again next turn um generic spell slinger value card i'm not really sure what you do with this yeah, other, so... other than that like it turns all of your cantrips into next turn cantrips again so well rather they have to be multicolored though right yeah yeah, they have to be multi-cards. So I actually had a pretty cool deck with this in uh, that I'm probably going to test for Pioneer, where you kind of build similar to like the Niv decks, but instead of playing a Bring to Light like five drop package, you play a ton of instants and sorceries. You can play like Pillage the Bog. There's a, a bunch of two mana removal spells, Lightning Helix, uh, so you can end up bringing people out. Coligan's Command. So if you end up casting a Coligan's Command, like you can just get Lila back. But you can do something cool with her, which is you can. So if if you cast so you know how there are, um, it's not for you, but there are the the split cards, mm -hmm. like Carnival Carnage and Cease to Sis, stuff like that. If you cast the cheap one, you can then cast the expensive one off the plot. On the which, is the, which is probably the best ones to do that with? Uh, on turn four, you can Carnival Carnage their one drop and then Lightning them for free the next turn. Um, there was one, I actually, I can bring up the deck list I had. Uh, Invert and Invent is maybe like, one that you can do for a value chain, um, push and pull. You can like reanimate a bunch of things. Breaking entering um, also works with it. Um, but again, you need like enough big things to make that matter. Um, so there's there's actually like a good amount. Um, uh, Bedeck Bedazzle was the one that I was looking at the most with it because you can just kill a creature and then blow up a land on the next turn. Presumably, all of the cards that you're playing with it have to be good enough on their own, even when you don't have Lila. Yeah. Yes, that's why it's mostly the removal spell ones that give like other value. Push pull, uh, Bedek Bedazzle. Maybe find Finality has a home or something. Uh, that's like a board wipe you can cast off of it. But even just like doubling up on like ill timed explosions or, you know, just removal spells is, is like maybe good enough. Growth Spiral, Pillage the Bog can be like draw spells. Um, you can still play the five mana Niv that lets you jumpstart uh, multicolor cards from your graveyard. But I, just, I don't think she's going to like crazy good or anything but you can do some cool deck building stuff does she her ability gets around flashback right uh i don't know i'll have to because it exiles the spell as it resolves so you have two resolve. you have two different re replacement effects it, right instead of putting it into graveyard but it depends on because it's instead of putting it into your graveyard as it resolves rather than as it resolves okay i'll have to double check that I'm so sure. it probably doesn't then all right pretty cool interesting card nonetheless Moving on, we have Lively Dirge. This is a two mana black sorcery with Spree. The Sprees are an additional one mana to search your library for a card and put it into your graveyard, then shuffle, or an additional two mana. Return up to two creatures from your graveyard with total mana value four or less to the battlefield. So this does make Entomb legal in Pioneer, albeit for three mana. And it is also kind of like two unearth stapled together in a, in a sense. So I guess the main place I would be looking to play this if I was going to play it is as an Entomb and to get uh, reanimation going, since I believe the cheapest reanimation spell in Pioneer is four mana. What are yes. your thoughts? Yeah, there's a couple at four mana. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's like initially where I would look at it as well. I think if you're playing that kind of deck, obviously you also get to play like Fable the Mirror Breaker. Um, maybe there's a version of Amalia that plays this, but, you know, because you can like find a piece and then return to the ranks it back or extraction specialist it and you can just return 
Amalia and Wild Growth Walker sometimes. So like maybe there's a version of that that ends up playing it as well. So this does say like five mana, go find two uh, two drops and put them into play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so like maybe there's a version that ends up playing that. Um, Amalia does typically play Prosperous Innkeeper as well. So you know you can kind of jump a little bit ahead on mana. I do that a little earlier. Um, so that's that's something worth worth considering there but immediately it's the thing that sticks out about this card is yeah it's a three mana sorcery all right moving on we've got lotus ring this is a three mana uh equipment with indestructible and it says equipped creature gets plus three plus three and has vigilance and tap sacrifice this creature add three mana of any one color and it equips for three i saw you were getting uh kind of salty on twitter because apparently this is the most expensive card in the set yep. at least right now now there's some caveats to that we are in pre-orders at the moment and also this is big score, so the big score cards are particularly rare. Like they're more rare than regular mythic rares because of how they're distributed slightly in the print. More, yeah, yeah, slightly more rare. But mythics, yes. but regardless, at least for pre-order pricing, this is the most expensive card in the set beyond any other bombs or yeah. lands or anything. Not even close. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk a little about that to begin with, and then we'll move on to like what does this card actually do? Yeah, I was gonna say. It- this is the Lotus tax. Anytime a mythic has Lotus in the name, it goes for an outrageous amount of price. Or Mox. Yes, or Mox, yeah. Like, this card does not deserve to be the most expensive set. So. Regardless of that, I believe, so the main thing to look at this card is obviously who cares about plus three and Vigilance. The main thing you want to do is move it around and generate a bunch of mana. So you can do that with yep. some uh, equip cost ch- cheating abilities. So there's stuff like Fervent Champion, Kazool's Toll yes. Collector. Like, there's a bunch of things that let you cheat on equip abilities. So what Here's was it that you were... What, were, what was it that you were, you were looking to do with it? So there's actually an infinite combo with this that is Pioneer Legal, uh, using Cole, the Forge Master, uh, and Fervent Champion. And so Cole is this this card that no one knows what it does because that card was the limited shaft. So 2 mana 2-2, two, two, and it says, whenever another non-token creature you control dies, if it was enchanted or equipped, return it to its owner's hand. And creature tokens you control that are enchanted or equipped get plus one, plus one. So basically, this plus Fervent Champion plus Lotus Ring is the equipability on the Lotus Ring is free. You equip it to your, your Fervent Champion. The Fervent Champion has haste, right? Yes, it has haste. It has haste. You tap sack, you generate three mana. Cold triggers, puts the Fervent Champion back in your hand. You cast the Fervent Champion, you equip to the Fervent Champion for free. You make infinite mana. Yes, of every color. Um, you then need a fourth uh, card to actually win the game. Yes, there is also a creature you can play alongside this that is a warrior which is relevant for Resolute Strike, um, Colossus Hammer, yeah. the, the equipped thing that's a warrior, that also gains haste with Lotus Ring and becomes an infinite damage combo, and that's Fireblade Charger. Um, so, because when it's equipped, it gains haste, so then you can also do it um, immediately, and you can loop it to just kill the opponent. Uh, All right. So, yeah, it's four cards, but you can tutor for Lotus Ring, and those creatures have some redundancy and, and backup support. So that's mostly what I'm looking at, personally, with it, is playing it in, like, the red white pioneer colossus hammer deck where you just have this infinite combo so all right moving on past lotus ring we've got magda the horde master this is a two mono red two two legend dwarf berserker whenever you commit a crime create a tap treasure the ability triggers only once a turn and sack three treasures create a four four red scorpion dragon creature token with flying and haste activate only as a sorcery so obviously much much different than the original magda you're not going infinite with this one because the ability only triggers once and the other ability doesn't tutor anything but in terms of like a value card, much easier to make three treasures than five with the original yes. Magda required. And you make the treasures via committing crimes rather than tapping dwarves. So also easier to get them that way, I guess. Although that only triggers once a turn. What were you thinking about with Magda? So I don't really know. I'm just throwing it in a bunch of decks right now and trying out. A lot of black red decks can pretty easily commit a crime. And then they're also fine just getting random four fours. Uh, like maybe there's a Rakdos mid variant that wants to play it because you know you also play Fable the Mirror Breaker, which is usually going to make a treasure. Um, Deadly Dispute decks could also maybe play it. They have a bunch of ways to commit a crime as well. They tend to also make some treasures. So maybe there's maybe you play one in Rakdosak or something. Um, there's also a couple other like playable two drops in Pioneer that make treasures as well. So you could feasibly um, just make a free 4-4 four, four on turn 4 off of this card without too much trouble. So that's kind of where I'm trying it out. Just trying to see. So. All right. Exper- I don't think there's any standout deck though. An experimental card then. Yes. All right. So moving on to our next one, we've got Mage Bane Lizard. This is a 2 mana red 1-4. And it says, whenever a player casts a non-creature spell, it deals damage to the player equal to the number of non-creature spells they've cast this turn. So it's an anti-storm card. Now, we've seen a number of these, or if not anti-storm, it's just like a tax. It's just a taxing effect in the form of damage to decks like Phoenix. Now, we've seen a number of these cards before. 
in the forms of like Eidolon of the Great Revel would be the most obvious one, but there's various red creatures that say like when your opponent casts certain types of spells or multiple spells, this thing deals damage to them. And my problem with them has always been that unlike the white rule of law cards that actually shut down combos, these don't shut them down. So if the opponent has a sufficient amount of life, they can often just combo through them anyway, or start the chain of like drawing a whole bunch of cards, find their removal spell, kill it, and then go off. Yeah. I, I think what makes this one a little bit different, I think this card is actually good versus Phoenix, whereas I think Eidolon is almost unplayable against Phoenix. And I think the difference is that on turns where they don't, you know, like there's a lot of turns where the Phoenix player will need to cast four or five or whatever um, spells. They just will probably die if they ever have to cast four or more. Um, but it is a one four. So it is pretty hard to kill. Uh, whereas Eidolon is pretty easy to kill. So a lot of the hate creatures just kind of die to just normal removal spells. And 1-4 is a lot harder to remove. Uh, notably, it's also mostly asymmetrical, whereas, like, you can race Eidolon pretty easily, even as a Phoenix player. You can just, like, kill their other creatures, put a Phoenix into play, attack them, and, like, if they cast spells, they're also taking damage. Uh, the other thing that Mage Main Lizard does is it actually matters against things like Lotus Field, where... Eidolons and Cinder Vines and things of that nature don't work against Lotus Field. They only cast like five, six spells. Um, and yeah, they have auto wars and stuff. But I think Mage Main actually adds up against that deck a little bit more. So because it also triggers off of like bigger spells. It doesn't care what the major spell is. So I've just I've seen this I've right. seen this type of effect so many times on creatures, and they're just never playable because the storm or spell slinger player can always just cast enough spells through it anyway to win. Yeah, I, I think Mage Bane Lizard is the best one that we've seen for a variety of reasons, though. Like it is much harder to remove. There's only a few removal spells that will actually remove it. Um, like what, like four toughness is a really important, uh, point. It's, it, it, there's a reason why in Pioneer, uh, Arkan of Amaria is pretty mediocre against Phoenix, but Eidolon of Rhetoric is actually pretty good against Phoenix. Um, because like, you know, they can't just kill it. So it, it takes a long time for them to remove it. Mage Green Lizard is like similar. Yeah, they can still cast a bunch of cantrips, but if they ever cast like four, sp like four spells, then it really like adds up. So they have to have the lightning axe like basically immediately. Um, so yeah, it's not like it's not like a rule of law effect, but I think this one is actually good, okay. unlike many of those. So just because it's hard to vote. It is just a sideboard card though. Yes, yes. Okay. But so, yeah, four toughness is a lot. So that's one. So moving on, we have Make Your Own Luck. This is a five mana blue and green sorcery, and it says look at the top three cards of your library. You may exile a non land card from among them. If you do, it becomes plotted. Put the rest into your hand. So basically uh, draw the top three cards of your deck, pick one of them, that's the most expensive one, and plot it so that you can cast it for free next turn. Yep. Uh, not really sure what you do with this, although... So every previous effect that we've seen like this, especially in Simic Colors, has been you always shuffle first so that you don't get to manipulate the top card of your deck, whereas this one does not do that. So if you have something that puts something on the top of your deck, you go put something on top of my deck. Unfortunately, this is a sorcery, so I guess you'd have to put it either at least one down from the top, or you'd have to have enough mana to do both. Yep. Yeah, where, I've been, where I have been playing this is... I'd mentioned before that I was playing a deck with... Uh, um, with like cryptic coats and cloaks and stuff like that. So the actual inspiration for that deck was to play hide in plain sight, plus a yielding gatekeeper, and you can blink an Atraxa or a Titan of Industry if you hit it. Um, and you can chain it with like den protectors and stuff. Make your own luck is a little bit of redundancy for that. Uh, if you have an Atraxa or a Titan of Industry in the top three cards of your deck, you can just cast it for free on the next turn so that's mostly where i've been looking at it is in those kinds of decks um, so, so this card basically has to this card basically has to go into a deck like btl right it has to be something that's slower that is going to have yes. the ability to have a bunch of mana yeah, and or, something that's like, and something that's a sufficient payoff that you actually want to pay five mana to try to get it right you can play it in decks where you're not playing like a control deck like btl but where you're playing like land where elves and elvish mystics and stuff where it's just like you're fine just you know playing this on three playing like any card recouping the other two cards because yeah you draw the other two cards like i think you can also play with mana dorks totally fine as well but yeah you can't do anything remotely fair with this but you can like play it in a couple decks at least I think so. all right moving on we've got malcolm the eyes this is a two mana blue and red two two legend siren pirate it has flying in haste and whenever you cast your second spell each turn investigate so I'm going to guess that I'm going to ask you if this is good in Phoenix, and you're going to say no, but let me know what you think. Yeah, uh, I don't think it's remotely playable in Phoenix, but I think there are other decks that could play it. Um, Pirates, it's, it's funny. Pirates is actually close to being a deck in Pioneer. Um, there's a lot of, like, cheap Pirates you can play, um, and, like, it may fit in there. 
Um, maybe there's there used to be a Ledger Shredder non Phoenix deck that was just like playing like Play with Fires and Reckless Rage as like a blue red prowessy deck, and that deck probably plays some number of Malcolm. Um, I'm not sure that the Insult X would really want this, um, even though it's kind of aggressive. But so I, I'm not really sure like where its home is. Uh, but it does work really well with Demonic Ruckus as well. So if there's a blue-red, there may be a blue-red, like, kind of plot aggro deck in standard because you have uh, Slickshot, Showoff, Malcolm, and uh, Ledger Shredder, and you can plot Demonic Ruckus on one, and those are all in standard. So then you can play a two-drop and then immediately trigger it. So um, so we may see it in, in that capacity. I have a unrelated question, which is, so between this effect of making clues and something like a Ledger Shredder that loots... Right, the whole you know when you cast your second spell each turn, investigate or whatever. Assuming that the fact that like, the clue itself being an artifact and stacking it is not relevant, what which is generally better in a spell slinger deck, looting or making clues? Looting, looting for sure. Yeah, I just feel like because you just don't have the time to keep spending the mana to crack the clues, right? Yeah, it, usually usually you'll get time to crack them, but um, it's just like it's a tempo loss. Like usually with the spell slinger decks, you want to maximize on like anything that's temp that's like tempo positive is like much more powerful uh so like clues are fine for that but uh looting is generally better all right next up we've got memory vessel this is a five mana red artifact and it says tap exile memory vessel each player exiles the top seven cards of their library until your next turn players may play cards they exiled this way and they can't play cards from their hand activate only as a sorcery so this is obviously another wheel effect although this one to me stands out in particular because so usually all of the wheel effects have the problem of you have to spend the mana to wheel and then you have to figure out how to get more mana after that because you don't want to ever wheel and then pass to your opponent and then they have a fresh hand and can interact with you. So you always want to like go off with all your storm stuff immediately. And so this is obviously reminiscent of memory jar, but it's a memory jar that is legal in Pioneer. So if there's storm stuff to do, this seems like a natural inclusion. Yeah, yeah it's, it's possible. Something you can also do with it is you can play it with Dranith Magistrate to like make it asymmetrical and works with the Avon Interrupter as well. So maybe that's like an angle too, um, but I'm, I'm not really sure. This card is, card is weird. I like that it exists, but yeah, it's very weird. It also technically is a silence for the hand. So if your opponent was yes. crafting things in their hand or their, or like your opponent is a combo deck that involves drawing a bunch of cards, then they can't actually play any of those. Yep, like Lotus Field. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. Moving on, we have Nexus of Becoming. This is a six mana artifact, and it says at the beginning of combat on your turn, draw a card, and then you may exile an artifact or creature card from your hand. If you do, you create a token that's a copy of the exiled card, except it's a 3 3 golem artifact creature in addition to its other types. So it basically, on combat, you draw, and then you can show and tell in an artifact or creature, except it's a 3 3. Mm -hmm. So what were you looking to do with this? Uh, mostly just, at, so I used to play blue white god pharaoh's gift even in pioneer there was a version of it and this is slightly better uh not having to tie the creature to the graveyard is actually a pretty big upgrade and it is one mana cheaper so a lot more reasonable to cast it so that's mostly what i was looking at with it is you can refurbish this into play maybe make some three three atraxas and and go from there it also it's artifacts not just creatures so you can put in um yeah. you can hit a portal to free yeah. as well uh-huh all yeah. right next up Nurturing Pixie, this is a single white mana 1-1 one, one fairy rogue creature with flying, and it says, when it enters the battlefield, you return up to one target non-fairy, non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand. If a permanent was returned this way, put a plus one counter on Nurturing Pixie. Why did I bring this up? Well, it's a card that's similar to things like Glint Hawk and Core Skyfisher, where it's a you know white creature that enters, bounces something to your hand. But this is the, it's one mana cheaper than Core Skyfisher, and unlike Glint Hawk, it can be any, uh, almost any permanent not just artifacts. The downside is obviously this is not Popper legal because it's an uncommon, but if there is any deck outside of Popper that wanted to play a core Skyfisher type card, this is now a way to do that. Really good. So it's funny you mentioned that. Um, in my Pioneer deck dump, I actually did, was playing a deck that played this in the Convoke because you can grab it off of Knight Errant and then bounce your Knight Errant and chain uh, from there. And you can bounce your Inspectors and your Epicures yes. and all those guys. Epicures. Uh, Imidanes is also a pretty good one as well. Um, and it's basically a one mana two two flyer, not on turn one, but after that. Yep. Uh, notably, Convoke typically now doesn't play Ornithopter or Legion's Landing anymore, but you could play this in in, in a deck with Ornithopter as well to just have a two two flyer on turn one, which is pretty reasonable. So I think this card has a lot of a lot of potential in Pioneer and Standard, but you need to be caring about small creatures. Uh, notably, obviously, you can't bounce other copies of itself 
um, to kill your opponent with the board leader's helix in standard, but uh, maybe there's still enough other stuff. Also, in uh, Pioneer, at least, you can, and, and standard Convoke, I guess, as well, you can bounce the white case that, that is the removal spell. Uh, so, And that may actually be a line that comes up. Mm -hmm. All right. Moving on from Nurturing Pixie, we have Oko the Ringleader, probably the most complicated card in the entire set to evaluate. <laughs> so this is, first of all, it's not it's not original Oko. It's nowhere close to original Oko. Let's just get that out of the way. Secondly, it's a four mana blue and green planeswalker. It starts with three loyalty, and it has a static ability that says at the beginning of combat on your turn, Oko the Ringleader becomes a copy of up to one target creature you control until end of turn, except it's hexproof. Then the abilities are plus one, draw two cards. If you've committed a crime this turn, discard a card, otherwise discard two cards. So you draw two, discard one if you've crimed, but if you haven't crimed, then you loot two. Minus one, create a 3-3 three, three elk. Minus five, for each other non-land permanent you control, create a token that's a copy of that permanent. So there's, oh my God, so much going on here. So it's a, it's a planeswalker that on combat can become co a copy of another creature you control that with hexproof. So it's planeswalker that can like attack your opponent, although... As the creature, uh, so it becomes a creature and therefore it is not affected by loyalty ability removing things, I believe, because it's now a creature and not a planeswalker. Although I believe you can still activate his loyalty abilities. I uh, I don't know. Yeah, you, you can still activate. Yeah, you, you yeah. can still activate the loyalty abilities, uh, but he won't lose loyalty counters from getting damaged in combat, I believe. Yes. Secondly, it then has an ability that loots and wants you to commit crimes and an ability that makes tokens, which I guess protects Oko. And then the ultimate, which is not too hard to get to, actually, because you only need to activate him. It's the third activation on, if you're assuming you're plussing him and he's not getting damaged. I don't see that Oko is like, his abilities all seem like very generically value-based and it doesn't seem like he takes you down any particular path of deck building. Yeah. So I guess the main question would be, is there a blue-green deck in, Pine, in probably in Pioneer, because I don't think he's good enough for Modern, that wants these type of generic value effects and is and also wants to play four drops i guess and are these effects good enough the deck that immediately stands out to me is as a sideboard card for attracts a neoform uh where you're fine which is value cards typically the opponent is going to fight over the graveyard a lot more post board and you're fine just playing a, a planeswalker you also play like a bunch of thought seasons and removal spells in that deck so you can actually use oko as like a form of card advantage uh uh, turning him into a copy of uh, like Hooting Mandrels is something that maybe you can kill the opponent pretty quickly now. Uh, so that's something that like I immediately was thinking of. I'm not really sure outside of that. Uh, maybe you can slot him into like a Rona deck or something. Um, but I don't think there's anything like pretty clean that would just want the Oko. But those were two that like immediately jumped to mind. My inclination that he's is he's probably not good enough, but. Yeah, he, his abilities are all generically good, and it's he's so difficult to evaluate because also all of his abilities do radically different things. Yeah, but he has four mana, so yeah. All right, moving on from moving on from Oko, we've got one last job. This is a three mana spree sorcery in white. So it's three mana, and then here are the spree modes: two mana, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield; one mana, return target mount or vehicle card from your graveyard to the battlefield; one mana, return target aura or equipment card from your graveyard to the battlefield attached to a creature you control. So Usually, of those cards, you want to return a creature, and mounts are pretty narrow in what you can get back, so it's basically five mana for reanimate, but you can potentially reanimate multiple things, although I don't know what the heck deck wants to play creatures, and also mount slash vehicles, and also aura slash equipment. The the coal deck that I mentioned with Fervent Champion, you can mm -hmm. return the equipment and uh, the creature. <laughs> So is this basically like late game with a, with a hammer yeah. equipment deck type thing? You just go, oh, you killed my stuff. Well, here's um, six mana, return both sure. pieces. Notably, it returns the equipment and then immediately attaches it. So it does work pretty well with uh, Colossus Hammer that's in the graveyard. It's just four mana, return Colossus Hammer and equip it. So I do think it actually fits like reasonably well. You can play Smuggler's Copter in those decks as well, which is a vehicle, but also is just like a pretty good card because you're playing a bunch of cheap creatures. Uh, and you can kind of cheat on mana a little bit if you by like discarding a card you want to return later. Um, so I, I think it can fit pretty well in a Colossus Hammer deck in Pioneer at least because you do typically. Well, I mean, I think it would be wrong to not play some number of Smuggler's Copter in that deck, but also like now that you have a combo, you can like return two halves, mm -hmm. but also just it, it equips Hammer. So I think in that deck it fits well. Notably, the return creature card is not restricted, so it is just a five mana reanimator creature. I think it was also uh, notable that it can get back Grease Fang and Essica's Chariot and yes. Sky Sovereign. So it can, like the better vehicles, it can get back on four mana rather than five. 
Yep. You could just also just straight up return a Parhelion on four uh, and then play a creature that crews it on five, uh, which is also something that uh, I think will, I think that'll come up because like once a Parhelion is in play for Greasefing, most of your deck will crew the Parhelion. So you don't really care how it gets into play. Just Greasefing is obviously the best, but you even just as four mana return target Parhelion to play could just be like, you know, a pretty viable plan. There are also some pretty good mounts. Like you can reanimate on four a Calamity. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Which like, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think there's a lot of like, you know, high ceiling effects with this pretty like reasonable floor. And it's the same issue a lot of graveyard cards have in that it's not free to get things into graveyard. In current magic, they've kind of toned that down quite a bit. Um, at least the things you want to get. Uh, but I, hey, you can play lively dirge on three and then play this on uh, four and return uh, amount, I guess. Whatever the heck you want. Uh, also, auras are not just restricted to like creature auras. There's also... Um... Overwhelming splendor. <laughs> there's that one. There's uh, captivated an audience in Rakdos. That's yes, captive audience. Yep. Yep. All right. Moving on. We've got Outcast Trailblazer. It is a three mana green for two human druid. When it enters the battlefield, add one mana of any color. So he always rebates you a mana. So if you've got something else to play for one mana, you can do it. But he also plots for three. So you can plot him for three and then cast him the next turn to get a mana for no mana. And then he also has, whenever another creature with power four or greater enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. So it seems like a pretty reasonable value card. It also is a card that lets you go turn three, plot, turn four, unplot, add a mana, play a five drop. What do you think of Outcaster Trailblazer? Yeah. Uh, I think this card's pretty good. Um, I'm mostly evaluating through the lens of Pioneer as opposed to other formats. Uh, in Pioneer, there's plenty of, of decks where you can plot on three or two if you play a Mana Dork. Like if I'm playing a Mana Dork and I plot this... Um, on turn two, then you can just play a five drop on turn three um, off just Mana Dork plus Outcaster Trailblazer, plus this and draw a card. Most five drops are going to immediately draw you a card with it, so plotting is actually like a way to rebate uh, a card as well to compensate for the time lost. Um, it also works pretty well with like Thoughtseize Fatal Push. You can just play it on three and then immediately push their creature for tempo or just Thoughtseize them, so you know, a little bit of a uh, a little bit of uh, variability from there. So uh, I, I I like this card a lot. Notably, we had kind of we because of Caustic Bronco, we had mentioned uh, that we you know creatures with power three or greater on turn three, and this one is pretty reasonable with it because you can play this on three and then play a one mana removal spell to kill their blocker, saddle, and immediately uh, Bronco from there. This also seems like a re this yeah. basically like the creature version of Kiora for the mono green deck. Yeah. Um, it's got the same power. It's got the same power four greater draw card ability, but it's also a four power creature itself. It adds a mana, so although it's not a permanent thing, and it obviously doesn't untap Nykthos, but in terms of like going from three to five, it does that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably a little bit better uh, against decks that play like Thalia or have like enough removal for your other creatures. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like this card quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of people kind of are underrating it. All right, moving on. We've got Pest Control. This is a two mana white and black sorcery, and it says destroy all non-land permanents with mana value one or less, and you can also cycle it for two mana. So it's obviously very narrow in what it can hit, although we have seen, I think the closest effect is uh, Hidetsugu Consumes All. Consumes all, yep. So if, you're, if you were a, the kind of deck that wanted to play that, but you're in white instead of red, or in addition to red, you can do the same effect for less mana. So this seems like just a card that's going to be a sideboard card that will occasionally show up in the same way that Hidetsugu Consumes All occasionally showed up. Yeah, I think uh, I think Niv can main deck it because you can also just cycle it. Uh, so, but yeah, I think it's mostly just a sideboard card for like Convoke and stuff. All right, next up we've got Phantom Interference, another spree card. So this is a single blue mana instant. And then for an additional three mana, you can create a 2-2 flyer. And for an additional one mana, you can counter target spell unless its controller pays two. So basically, base rate, this is essentially make this appear. But then it can also, instead of Make Disappear, be a 4 mana 2 2 flyer, or way later in the game, be 5 mana to Make Disappear plus 2 2 flyer. I'm not sure exactly where this goes since it seems like um, Blue White Control has just switched to No More Lies as their 2 mana counter spell, and the other 2 mana counter spell is Dito. But there are, I guess, like N Phoenix or like other Is It control decks like uh, Creativity that play Make Disappear, and this could potentially be better than that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think I would play this in, in Blue Red Transmog. Typically, they don't play Make Disappear anymore. They play Spell Pierce, but just having more token generation on your counter spells is nice. I'm actually, I would consider this in any Invasion of Segovia deck, but the notable one for me is, I know a lot of the Spirits players are on No More Lies right now as well, um, but I, I think they should try this card out. Like, just 
randomly being a four mana two two spirit is not like the worst, uh, especially with like supreme phantoms and stuff. So um, I'm currently trying. I'm going to be testing a ton of pioneer this week, uh, pretty rigorously. I'm starting out with two in spirits just to kind of see how it feels. Um, I think make disappear is just a generally overrated card. I think uh, in standard in particular, a deck like soldiers. I haven't been playing make disappear for a while. I've been playing the one that suspects a target creature, and I. I I would uh, think that I would play some number of this over Make Disappear as well. Even it, It's weird that like Make Disappear, even by sacking a creature that's kind of whatever, it still gets outpaced pretty quick. Um, so I think this fits more into like the low creature decks who are fine just playing a 2-2. Well, I personally think it fits best in like Transmog Creativity stuff because those decks are already oh, blue sure. counterspell decks yeah. that also want to play cre- uh, token generators. Yeah, they, yeah they, they want the token, yeah. All right, moving on. We have Pillage the Bog. This is a two mana black and green sorcery. And it says, look at the top X cards of your library where X is twice the number of lands you control. Put one of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. And you can plot it for three mana. So this is one of the few examples where the plot cost is actually more expensive than the regular cost. Um, Presumably, even if you're playing this on turn two, you are at minimum looking at the top four cards. And then anytime you're playing it later than that, you're looking at even more cards. Yes. So, I... <laughs> it, like, base rate, it's, it basically feels like the Golgari version of Impulse, essentially, where you're looking at the top four and you're getting a card out of the top four. And then sometimes you can plot it so that you can, like, double spell so that you can go, like, okay, it's turn three and I'm not really doing anything right now. And, if you know, if I paid two mana for Pillage of the Bog, I would not have enough mana to do anything else. So I'll plot it and then next turn I'll cast it for free and then get and then play the thing that I searched for immediately. Yeah. Uh, I think this card is ridiculous, um, at least in the context of Pioneer. I immediately started testing for an Amalia, and I'm never going back. This card is crazy. Um, it's close to Demonic Tutor. Uh, obviously, on turn two, it's not quite as good, but, like, I've been plotting it a lot, and then you just play it on four. And and three mana look at eight is, like, r- reminds me a lot of, like, it's like an inverse once upon a time. But, like, I've liked this card a lot. I'm going to try it in a bunch of other decks. Spelunking, a couple copies in Niv. I'm going to play it in... Uh, and like the Neoform attracts a deck, I think wants to play it. It plays pretty well with founding the third path. Uh, just I, I, I think this, this card is really good. Um, so I'm more than happy to play four copies in Amalia because it's kind of like more Court of Callings at four lands. The card like look at eight is just crazy. So. It also seems like the kind of card that might initially be underrated just because it's not like a big flashy mythic rare creature and it's not a dual land. It's just a it's one of those cards that looks very unexciting. It's just, oh, okay, I play yeah. some mana, and I look at some cards, right. and, I, and I pick a card. It's like, you know, Impulse like, is not an exciting yeah. card. Right, like Expressive Iteration and Once Upon a Time, you know, it took a while before people realized how, like, crazy busted those cards were. All right, so moving on, we've got Pitiless Carnage. This is a four mana black sorcery, and it's sacrifice any number of permanents you control, then draw that many cards, and you can plot it for three mana, including two black pips. So we have seen sack permanence to draw cards before but it's always been on cards that are more expensive than this so probably the most uh famous one is like god eternal bantu yep now this card obviously doesn't give you a creature it doesn't give you anything other than just the cards that you're drawing however but it's free (laughs) you can go three plot next then not next turn but at some point later uh sack a bajillion things and draw a gajillion cards you can also sack lands if you don't if you know you just need to draw more or if sacking lands is important it also gives you a card that lets you just sack whatever you want when a mayhem devil's in play mm-hmm. so you can go like yep. plot pitiless carnage next turn sack mayhem devil sack everything on the board kill you yep kill you yep yep uh there's also a lot of extra filler like i would i would absolutely try one or two copies of this in rakdos sack uh, I also want to try it with Demonic Pact as well, just like more things for that. There's a Demonic Pact I played a while back that was like a Doom Foretold deck, and you played uh, like Treacherous Blessing and stuff. Um, so maybe like that kind of deck. Um, yeah. There's also just like yeah. so many cards running around that are cheap cards that produce tokens. Yes. In particular, like map, <laughs> treasure, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Uh, something I was also looking at for this card was potentially Spelunking plus Blended Reclamation slash uh aftermath analyst deck because you can plot this and then you can end up having like uh, a, a turn where you would have splendid wreck and you just tap and you sack all your lands draw a bunch of cards cast this for free use the mana you know stuff like that so maybe it can fit into like some kind of uh um, spelunking deck as well so mm-hmm. moving on we've got railway brawler this is our thrag tusk for the set it is a five mana green creature it's a five five rhino warrior it has reach trample 
Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, put X plus one counters on it, where X is its power. So every other creature that enters after this guy does is double the power. And it plots for four. So you can go four mana plot, then you get this five, five reach trample with the other ability. Take it away, Dylan. Yeah, so I was mostly looking at this card in um, Voldar and Thrillseeker decks that also play mana dorks to where you can plot it on three and then possibly just kill your opponent on the next turn. Uh, also notably, like everything, it combos with Calamity uh, to just kill the opponent as well because um, the Calamity will enter uh, and then the token you make will enter and then the next token you make will will you know also enter. So maybe there's some kind of like turn five kill you with Calamity nonsense in standard because you can, you can plot this on four and then Calamity saddle attack kill them. Uh, but also it's possible you just play with Voldar and Thrillseeker in Pioneer uh, where again, I think this is a card where you're really looking to plot it I think that's kind of the rule of thumb for a lot of the plot cards is you want to plot it for a really powerful setup turn. So that's uh, that's mostly where I see it is in like green X, like mid-range aggro decks like that want to attack. Uh, Reckless Storm Seeker works like pretty well too because it gives things haste. Uh, yeah, if you plot this and then cast Imidanes, the game is over. Uh, it basically makes Imidanes plus another creature always lethal. So mm -hmm. yep. So that's, that's like the other is plot this, uh, play this, um, play creature, play Imidanes, kill you. Gotcha. All right, so moving on, we've got Requisition Raid. This is a single white mana sorcery, and it has three modes that all cost a generic mana. So we've got Destroy Target Artifact, Destroy Target Enchantment, and put a plus one counter on each creature target player controls. So the card it most closely resembles is Wear Tear. However, it is a sorcery, and it is technically more expensive to destroy. I forget which mode on Wear Tear is one mana, but it's more expensive. Yeah, so it's two mana instead of one if you're only shooting one target. However, it has the additional upside of one, you don't need to have red mana, and two, you can use the plus one counter on all of your dudes mode. Mm -hmm. So this seems like a reasonable thing. Like, I assume the card, this card is primarily going to be used to destroy artifacts or enchantments in decks that don't have red for wear tear. Or if you are playing like an aggro deck like humans or something where you want this destroy artifact enchantment mode, but you also then have the plus one counter mode be relevant. Yes. So... Uh, I actually think in most decks that play Wear and Tear, if they play creatures at all, would much rather play this than Wear and Tear. Uh, also, notably, with how it's worded, uh, because you resolve them in order, this is actually quite good against Temporary Lockdown, because say they hit a bunch of your creatures, you can do Destroy Target Enchantment and put counters on, on your own creatures. It blows up the Temporary Lockdown first, and then all the creatures you get back get a counter on it. So it's actually pretty good against Temporary Lockdown if you're playing a bunch of creatures. Um, so I think like Convoke Humans may be heroic in some capacity. I think a lot of decks in Pioneer, at least, are looking for this card. In Modern, a bit less so, because instant speed may matter more. I don't really know. Uh, and people tend not to play as many go-wide creature decks. But at least in Pioneer, I think this card is like a really good sideboard card. I think Amalia maybe plays one. They they usually don't need to because they play Haywire Mites. But yeah, but I think Convoke for sure plays this. All right. So moving on to our next one, we have Riku of Many Paths. So this is, brace yourself, this is a lot. So we've got a three mana, green, blue, and red, three, three legendary human wizard. And it says, whenever you cast a modal spell, choose up to X, where X is the number of times you chose a mode for that spell. Okay, so before we get to the modes, Riku of Many Paths has three, has three modes that he can trigger. And the number of modes that you get depends on the number of modes in the modal spell that you cast to trigger Riku. Okay, so with that said, the modes are... Exile the top card of your library until the end of your next turn, you may play it. Put a plus one counter on Riku of Many Paths against Trample until end of turn. Create a 1-1 one, one Bluebird creature token with flying. This was not a card I had on my list to discuss, so take it away, Dylan. Yeah, I don't really think this will show up anywhere in particular. Um, there's not really much redundancy for it, so if you're trying to build around it and construct it, it's going to be really difficult. But there are like a pretty... There's a lot of modal spells now. There's a lot of charms and commands. Uh, like Prismari Command is pretty good to pair with this. Um, obviously, the Spree cards uh, work as well. But I don't think there's anything like incredible that stands out. But I would be surprised if like no one tried to pair it with. I mean, Prismari Command is like a pretty straightforward one. I think that works really well uh, with this. I mean, obviously, you need to untap with it. But um, but yeah, it, it's just a value engine. There's a lot of modal cards in both Standard and Pioneer. So uh, similar to Caravac, this is not really a three drop. This is more like a five drop or a six drop where you play it on three and you immediately get a rebate off the effects. You usually will want to be getting two of the effects 
Um, most notably to exile the top card and then make a 1-1 bird. Putting counters on Riku probably is not really a good play. They're probably going to try and kill it. But So I, it just strikes me as another one of those 3-mana three 3-3s. Three you don't want to play it on turn 3 like value engines. So All right. But you can play it with Jagantha, so... Mm -hmm. Always important. Can we just ban Jagantha already? Like, or just yes, Errata uh, Companion? I'm so yes. I'm so tired of looking at a deck and being like, okay, does the deck pass the Jagantha test? Okay, oh, Jagantha's in it. Or or forgetting Jagantha and being like, oh, right, I should have Jagantha in this deck. <laughs> yes. I hate how Jagantha is enough of an upside that, like, yeah, just five mana five fives are, like, pretty good that, that uh, a lot of otherwise interesting deck building decisions are just left out of magic. All right, moving on, we have Ruthless Lawbringer. This is a... Three mana, black and white creature. It's a 3-2 vampire assassin, and it says when it enters the battlefield, you may sack another creature. When you do, destroy target non-land permanent. Uh, this, I believe, is the cheapest version of this effect we've ever had. Of course, we've had plenty of effects that are a creature that enters and sacks something and then blows something up. But this specifically, one, hits any non-land permanent, not just other creatures, and two, is only three mana. Yes. I don't know exactly where this goes, but it seems good enough to show up somewhere, like Amalia yeah. maybe, or... Yeah, I, I, yeah, I've been trying it in Amalia because currently what Amalia lacks is... So Skyclave is really good and probably better overall, but it is really important to be able to hit five drops. Uh, For uh, Quakebringer. Uh, yeah, Quakebringer is a big one. And you currently don't really have any options unless you want to play like a Werefox Bodyguard, which is pretty bad. Um, you can also get kind of cute with this and you can sack a Voice of Resurgence on Curve. And that's a way to like preserve uh, board presence. And it may actually be an upgrade in many matchups of going tur turn two voice uh, attack, they don't want to trade turn three Lawbringer their their creature. You still get to keep a 2-2. Two -two. Um, so that's something I've been looking at as well. Um, so mostly Amalia. There may be some kind of black-white other kind of deck that plays it. Um, there used to be a black-white Vampires variant in Pioneer that would probably be more than happy to throw away a Dusk Legion um, Zealot uh, uh, in order to do that. Um, but outside of that, I think it's mostly Amalia is where I'd be looking to play this card. All right, just it's basically just a role player. Like it's not a card that's incredibly good. It just does what it needs to do at a good rate. Yep. All right, moving on, we've got Satoru the Infiltrator. This is a two mana black and blue legendary two three human ninja rogue with menace, and it has whenever it and or one or more other non token creatures enter the battlefield under your control, if none of them were cast or no mana was spent to cast them, draw a card. So just like up the beanstalk before it, it triggers off of all of your evoke elementals to draw you a card and replace them. It also triggers off all of your plot dudes off of, uh, I'm not sure what else. Those are like the main things I can think of that it triggers Cryptic off coat. of. Cryptic Coat. Cryptic Coat's a big one, yeah, because it uh, it cloaks the top card. So it's not a token. So on curve, we, we'll probably see that in standard and pioneer. Turn two Satoru, turn three Cryptic Coat, draw card, attack with Satoru. Now you have two unblockable creatures. Uh, Ninjutsu uh, also works with it. Um, one of the decks I had actually was uh, the Kamigawa Neon Dynasty sagas, like Fable and Modern Age and stuff like that. When they transform, they actually will trigger Satoru as well. So you could play it with Fable. Yeah, obviously Malika Rebirth nonsense. But something too is I had a I have a cool deck uh, in my deck dump that plays Narcomoeba and Prized Amalgam with Satoru. And you can play Cauldron Familiar as well. And Cauldron Familiar is going to draw each time it enters. Uh, there's actually like a surprisingly large amount of cards that uh, will trigger Satori. So obviously it's not as flexible as up the beanstalk and it doesn't immediately draw you another card, but I don't know. I just, it pisses me off that it's like, oh great, another card where you can free cast grief and redraw a card off of it. Yeah. Thankfully, I mostly can ignore that format, but uh, I think uh, this, this is definitely a card where they clearly designed it not thinking about eternal formats that have grief. I think they mostly were looking at, oh, there's a lot of things you can do in standard and pioneer with, with this type of card. Uh, so. so just to break it down again, it's evokers, it's fr the free evokers, it's transform enchantment creatures, it's yeah. anything that like manifests a guy. Yeah. Plot. Plotting guys, there is just like anything that lets you free cast a creature regardless of what that thing is. Yeah. And then there are the, and then there's like uh, returns from your graveyard to the battlefield cards like Cauldron Familiar. Any sort, yeah, of reanim minor. any sort of reanimation effect also triggers it. Is that basically the broad swath of what gets it? Yeah, that's that's mostly it, yeah. You have to jump through some hoops, but in, in like, obviously pairing it with grief and, you know, that kind of stuff is is uh, pretty good. Um, oh, ephemerate too. Don't forget yeah, that. Yeah, the, the blink effects, yeah. yeah. In standard, we were, I was looking at uh, returning it with extraction specialist if the opponent kills it and just immediately drawing a card off of that because it triggers when Satoru enters as well so you can Malakar how insanely good is this card in Esper Gorios in modern that deck plays 
Solitude, Grief, and Ephemerate. And, right. <laughs> and and uh, Gorio's Vengeance. Yeah. Like, holy crap. Yes. All right, moving on. We've got Scorching Shot. It is a two mana red, red sorcery, and it says it deals five damage to target creature. So basically, if you were playing Roast before and paying double red instead of a generic red, a generic colorless and a mana, and a red mana is like not an issue and you can just pay the double red, which is probably the case since if you're playing Roast, it means you're probably a mono red deck to begin with and don't really have options out for like other color removal. And this just seems like it's not a strict upgrade over Roast because of the cost, but it seems pretty much it's just going to upgrade over Roast and basically any deck that was playing Roast. Yep. Yeah, I mean, the main thing is you can't play it with Gigantha, uh, which is the biggest knock against it. But in both Standard and Pioneer, the Mono Red decks actually have a playable card. Because the problem before was they played, they had to play a card that dealt with, like, Shouldred, but they also needed a card that dealt with, like, Flyers that were also kind of big. And Scorching Shot's, like, the only one now. Because uh, it's funny, in, in Pioneer, there was a, a mono red list that was playing Roast and Tears of Valakut in its board. Tears for Vein Ripper, and then uh, <laughs> Roast for the bigger ground creatures. But Scorching Shot just does all of that. So uh, as long as you're not playing Gigantha, Scorching Shot's probably pretty reasonable if you were looking for that effect. So All right. Next up is Seize the Secret. This is a three mono blue sorcery. It costs one less to cast if you've committed a crime this turn. And it's draw two cards. So I assume this is just like another test card for Phoenix. Like pretty easy to commit a crime. And then it's just a two mono draw two. Or pretty easy to slot into like blue black control. You go turn three, thoughts is your opponent or any removal spell. Then two mono draw two. Yeah, the deck I was looking at the most for this was actually, I mentioned the Prof's Eidetic Memory deck, the blue black one. Uh, mostly in there. So obviously you have Duelists of the Mind. You have Prof's Eidetic Memory, Ledger Shredder, Thoughts use Fatal Push, Cling to Dust, stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, just that deck really, any of the Duelists of the Mind decks really works quite well with that. So we may actually see that in standard Duelists of the Mind, Cease of Secrets, uh, Prof's Eidetic Memory. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's anything like nuanced about this card. So All right. Yeah. Next up, we've got Seraphic Steed. This is a two mana green and white 2-2 unicorn mount. It has first strike and lifelink. And when it atta- whenever it attacks while saddled, you create a 3-3 white angel with flying. Now it saddles for four. So you need to tap four power in order to saddle it. But there again... Plenty of creatures, especially in green, that have four power or more on three. So presumably the curve you want is turn two, you play Seraphic Steed. Turn three, you play some big green creature like Lovestruck Beast or whatever it is. Saddle the Seraphic Steed, you attack, and you make a 3-3. I think setting that up is not the issue. I think the bigger issue is going to be, are you able to going are you going to be able to consistently attack a 2-2 creature, even if it has first strike into your opponent on turn three, even if you get a 3-3 angel in compensation? I think that's where uh, Outcaster uh, Trailblazer comes in. Because you play it on three, and then you spend the one mana to kill their blocker. That's like... Yeah. I, I, I think the, th- the thing is, too, is people will, will, will point to a lot of, like, two power creatures and be like, oh, well, they don't attack. But, like, that's just, like... So, like, that's just not really true. Like, it is very easy to get a... to be able to attack with two twos. Like, if that wasn't the case, Fable the Mirror Breaker would just not be a good card, right? Like, if, if, if it made a creature that, like, you know, just... If it just made a treasure, like, on a delay, card would be good, but it wouldn't, like, be nearly the presence it is. Like, most creatures that see play in Pioneer, for example, and even in Standard, that are two and three, most of them have two toughness. So it is pretty reasonable, I think, to actually be able to attack uh, with this card. Now, you probably don't, you don't get to attack with it forever, but even just attacking once and then making a 3-3, like, that's, you know, that's good enough um so i like if you if you look at a lot of what the most played uh twos and threes are in both pioneer and standard like there are some three mana three threes like a sure graver trespasser if poem plays soren whatever but like generally speaking there's a lot of like blood tithe harvesters uh uh deep cavern bats there's like one ones uh, and stuff so uh, i i don't think it will really be a problem attacking i think it actually is harder to saddle this uh, on curve than it is to actually be able to attack so that's that's more of my concern but on the one hand something i was thinking about was that grease fang can also crew it but uh, unfortunately mounts don't work quite with uh grease fang mm-hmm. it is in theory a mount i guess you could play you play the the white card that returns you could play this as well but how good do you actually think, think this card is i think it's pretty good in standard um i'm actually i'm gonna try i have a deck with it in pioneer that i'm gonna try uh either today or tomorrow um and that that deck at least you know curves out pretty well so uh, we'll see so i don't know uh it's really fucking hard to evaluate these mounts um but i don't think it's hard to be able to attack with it i think it's harder to play cards that crew it that don't feel awful crewing it but there is a card uh 
later towards the end of uh, that works with it. Yeah. Set review. That works with it. And that actually I'm playing that out and Outcaster. So I'm pretty sure this was meant to be a standard deck um, because we have Outcaster and um, Wily or whatever. So we have those plus like there's other mounts that are also work with those cards as well. So I think it was supposed to be like a green, white or an Absan standard deck. Um, and if you look at that, that makes sense because most of the early creatures in standard, this can actually attack into. So. All right. So moving on from Seraphic Steed, we have Shoot the Sheriff, another and yet another long line of conditional two mana black removal spells. So this is a two mana black instant, and it says destroy target non-outlaw creature. So again, the outlaw creatures are assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks. In parentheses, uh, everyone else is fair game. So the main question here is going to be, what are the relevant creatures that have those types that are, you know, the highly played creatures in each format, as opposed to if you were going to play, say, Go for the Throat or, you know, some other conditional removal spell. So I have compiled some of the more played outlaws, and the most notable one is, of course, going to be Ragavan. Some other notable ones are cards like Vein Ripper, Dothy Voidwalker, Fairy Mastermind, Brazen Borrower, Conspicuous Snoop, Extraction Specialist, Picklock Prankster, and Hopeful Initiate. There's some other ones, but these ones were the ones that I felt were like the most notable outlaws. I think... Obviously, a ton from this set as well. Yeah, like th these are the ones that are not even counting the set. These are the ones that are just already around. So I feel like two mana black removal spells are not like terribly highly played in modern. And when they are, they're usually just terminate. But I think the fact that Ragavan is an outlaw alone would mean that the card is absolutely not playable in modern. Then add on top of that Dothy and other stuff. Dothy, yep, yep. In Pioneer, the fact you can't hit Vein Ripper is a pretty big deal. Yeah, also we have Bitter Triumph in uh, that like it's just... It, it bitter triumph is in standard as well so it's like i would be it, it would be weird to like ever see anyone cast this card i feel um so like the main problem is going to be basically that there are creatures that are of those types that are already played enough to where it makes shoot the sheriff not really viable but then on top of that o you know only more creatures will get printed and every time another highly playable outlaw gets printed it's just going to make the card even worse than it was before I I would have liked to have seen this card as a one mana sorcery, personally. Um, so because it's it, it occupies the same standard format as Bitter Triumph and Go for the Throat. Like printing this at two, I guess. I mean, when they designed this set, they didn't have the current rotation in mind. Um, but that's like my thoughts. Is it, it, I would have liked to have seen it be a little more pushed as a one mana sorcery. All right, are we? Is our verdict not playable? Yeah, yeah, not not playable. Maybe post rotation standard, I guess, but not crossing my fingers for that. All right. So moving on, we've got Simulacrum Synthesizer. This is a three mana blue artifact, and it says when it enters the battlefield, scry two. And then whenever another artifact with mana value three or greater enters the battlefield under your control, you create a zero zero construct artifact creature token with this creature gets plus one plus one for each artifact you control. So basically, ETB scry two, and then whenever another artifact with mana value three or greater enters under your control, create a construct. So obviously, other than scrying, this card doesn't do anything when it enters. Like, it doesn't affect the board when it enters. But wow, creating a construct for every single value 3 plus artifact that enters seems insane. Yeah, you curve it into Thousand Moon Smithy, just kill the opponent on the next turn. Whew. Yeah, so I think the main obstacle is just going to be like how many... Yeah. Artifact yeah. decks are there with lots of three plus, you know, three or greater mono value cards are there. And so again, there's some like the Thousand Moon Smithian Metalwork decks that we've mentioned before, but there's not. Isn't Pioneer basically just dominated by four decks right now and everything else is yeah, off to the side? Yeah. I mean, again, like just because a, a format is like pretty stale going into a set doesn't mean that like, you know, these cards can't be good, right? Like, um, especially in a format like Pioneer. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the format's pretty narrow in power level. Like, I'd be surprised if this saw like substantial, play. but I think it's pretty, I think it pairs pretty well with Thousand Moon Smithy, and Thousand Moon Smithy is already almost good enough to be a deck. So, like, we see it, see it periodically anyway. Um, and also, like, you can then Yori and Thousand Moon Smithy and something else. And, like, so I, I, I think there, there could be a version that, that plays it. Um, so, because it's a lot of value stapled onto this, it just takes time. So. It's more about the shell that's around it being viable more so than the card itself. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and the artifact, the slow artifact decks are close. Um, we've seen them pop up periodically anyway. So, also, Mightstone Weakstone exists, which is also a good way to catch up uh, Sky Sovereign, things like that. All right. So, moving on, we've got Slick Sequence. This is a two mana blue and red instant, and it says it deals two damage to any target. If you've cast another spell this turn, draw a card. So, presumably, you wanted to test this in Phoenix. Uh, yes. What has your testing borne out? Uh, I haven't actually cast it yet. Um, I don't think Phoenix is a very good home for it. I think I would be more likely to play this in like a blue red. 
um, Soul Scar Mage, Swift Spear, Elusive Otter, like a blue red prowess deck, I think is where I'm, I'm more likely to like it. Um, I, it's funny, I, I think I would, this card would be insane if it was reversed, if it was always draw a card. And then if it's if you've cast an order spell this turn, deal two. Um, the default mode of two mana deal two is just, you know, not really what these kinds of decks are looking for. They would rather cantrip first. That way it's at least like playable on that. Um, but I think I, I I think the problem I have with it in Phoenix is Highway Robbery exists and we're already getting like other cards that kind of do what this does better. Um, so that's yeah. But I, I think I would play it more in like Swiss Spear decks is where I'd be looking at it. Also, I think another thing is like Bone Crusher aside, Shock is just not that good of an effect. Well, Shock is really good. Um, I mean, two mana Shock. Yeah, I mean it's fine. Like we've played like Magma Jets and stuff in constructor formats before, right? But it's not like you, like you don't want to do it. But if if there's a, enough like like if half the time you're drawing a card, like that's probably good enough, right? Mm -hmm. So, but it's also another card that's like secretly not a two drop. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's usually a three. All right. So moving on from slick sequence, we've got slick shot lock picker. This is a three mana blue two, three creature. It's a human rogue. And it says when it enters the battlefield, target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback until end of turn. The flashback cost is equal to its mana cost and you can plot it for the same cost. So plot it for three. So presumably this is basically like three mana Snapcaster mage that you can plot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually think this one's pretty solid. Uh, the decks that would want this effect are more likely to be able to plot anyway. Uh, and it doesn't really work with counter spells, so you want to be playing it with like removal, board wipes, or card draw spells. And notably, it does work with Seed the Truth. Uh, giving Seed the Truth flashback is pretty nice. There's a ton of cards now that make Seed the Truth into possibly like a, just a straight up good draw engine. Um, I'm currently trying a couple copies of this in blue black control because you can plot it and then save it later. Um, and we'll, we'll see how that works out. Um, yeah, I mean, they, like, I don't think this fits into like Phoenix or anything like that, but there could be like some kind of blue red burny kind of deck that wants to play this that's fine plotting um maybe you play it in some like maybe there's a blue black mid-range deck that plays like this in satoru but i i don't expect this card to see very much play uh, but the plot makes it i think the for this card the plot is the default that's that's what i'm looking at like you don't really want to like because if you're trying to cast this card and you're not plotting it it's like a five drop to cast a two mana spell, which is not particularly exciting. So I think plotting is is the default for this card. Uh, and I think the decks that can do that are like blue black control, stuff like that. All right. So then on to a much more exciting slick shot. So we've got the slick shot show off. This is a two mana red creature. It's a one two bird wizard with flying in haste. And it says whenever you cast a non creature spell, slick shot show off gets plus two plus zero until end of turn. And you can plot it again for the same cost for two mana. So. Dylan, as the resident Phoenix player, is the best Kiln Fiend ever printed good in the deck? Not main deck, um, but I'm, I, ugh. I will be trying it out as a sideboard plan versus, like, say, Lotus Field, where you want to be pretty aggressive. Uh, so I'm going to be playing it in, like, the Young Pyromancer slot and trying it out from there. Uh, but I do think this card is just, like, kind of insane in the format in general. Uh, it is a wizard, which is actually really relevant because... Uh, the red the red aggro decks have wanted to play Wizards Lightning, but there's just not enough good Wizards. And this ups your count to, I think, enough Wizards. You can easily play, like, 14 to 18, like, good Wizards, which is plenty for Wizards Lightning. This card just seems like it's absolutely insane in every single red aggro deck, like Heroic, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Heroic Prowess, Mono Red. Um, yeah, Burn. Yeah, it, this, this card is really good. Uh, the curve, I, I imagine we'll see curves of turn one, plot, demonic ruckus turn two plot slick shot show off turn three basically kill your opponents um like i don't think that's too hard to do um yeah i i like this card a lot actually i printed up 16 proxies of it so i'm gonna have a bunch of different decks uh, that i'm gonna be testing uh, testing with it i think this card's just like kind of nuts so also works in pia as well i've been playing four of it in pia because uh, it does trigger Pia, it gives you more aggressive draws. It's just everything that deck, that deck wants to do. Also, and I don't know if I should mention this, but my mind just... If you look at the the part of the art on the card that's like cut on the border, I know that's supposed to be like a throwing knife, but it looks like something else to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving on. Smuggler's Surprise. This is a green single mana instant with Spree. So the Spree modes are... 
Two mana, mill four cards. You may put up to two creatures and or lands from among the milled cards into your hand. Five mana, which includes a green pip. You may put up to two creature cards from your hand onto the battlefield. And finally, one mana, creatures you control with power four or greater gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. So the, when I first saw this card, people were mentioning it as potentially an amulet titan, which doesn't sound so great to me, but it is a way to dig into creatures and lands if you're missing amulet, you know, if you're missing primeval. It also lets you put primeval titan into play in a way that bypasses subtlety and then also has a protect your guy from removal mode. So there's enough going on there that sounds interesting enough to test it out at least. Yeah, I, I, I think this card should see some play. I know in the Pioneer Realm... And standard, I think this is probably unplayable. I was trying to make it work um, with a couple of different decks. Obviously, it does, even though it can double as a as like a protection spell, it's like pretty narrow. Only protects big things. I had mentioned that um, in standard, calamity uh, combos with um, Terror of the Peaks. This can put them both into play on six uh, and find them. Yes, and find them. And on seven, you can put them both into play as indestructible and hexproof, which means that at seven, you can win the game if you have them both in hand. Uh, and you could, in theory, I mean, Thunderous debut is like eight mana, but like if you're building towards that, maybe you could play that as well. And that also puts them both into play. So there could be something cooking there. But All right. Is there like any, I guess that's it, right? That's it for the applications. It's basically, yeah. Okay. So on to the next card, we've got Spinewoods Armadillo. This is a six mana green, seven, seven Armadillo with Reach, Ward three. And then the actual reason you want to play the card is a one and a green, discard it, search your library for a basic land or desert. Reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle, you gain three life. So basically, Herd Migration has essentially that same ability. And so this is just a card that either replaces Herd Migration or is played in addition to Herd Migration in decks like Quintorius. Yes. So in Quintorius, I think this is better than Herd Migration. Uh, that deck's backup plan of casting six mana big creatures is reasonable. Uh, and uh, 177 with Reach is better than like 533s in Pioneer. Notably, um, the, one of the other reasons I think this is better is in my, in my Quintorius list, I'm playing four of this and then some number of herd migrations and because they can't duress this on turn one. So, which does come up that they'll just like, they can duress a herd migration, slow you down a little bit. Um, but also this can find a conduit pylons, which like, so you get to turn your scry land, your surveil land into a desert. So you can just discard, find the conduit pylons, play it to kind of dig a little bit. So I think that alone makes it like, you know, a bit better than herd migration in Quintorius, whereas in standard herd migration is better than this card because just making three threes is, is better than them seven seven. Though maybe standard domain plays both. I'm not sure. Yep. So narrow use, but good at what it does. I'm also uh, one one other thing too. I am also always on the lookout in Pioneer in particular for big creatures that discard themselves for value, like um, Waker of is a Waker of Waves or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so stuff like that, would, sometimes that comes up in Pioneer. So. For what, like reanimation effects or something? Yeah, yeah, it just gives you more reanimation options. There's nothing, like, worth doing it right now, but, I mean, now you have a couple. Now you have another, like, kind of big creature, so. All right, so moving on, we have Step Between Worlds. This is a five mana blue sorcery, and it says, each player may shuffle their hand and graveyard into their library. Each player who does draws seven cards, exile Step Between Worlds, and you can plot it for six mana. So similar to the red wheel before, this is our blue wheel, and it's got the same sort of thing of, like, wheels, usually the problem is that you cast them, and then you don't have much mana, you either have no or little mana to do anything else the same turn, and that's a problem because you never want to pass to your opponent, so now you can plot your wheel, then you can next turn wheel not having to pay anything for it, and then win off of whatever you wheeled into. Yep, it reminds me of uh, Gear Hulk plus Commit to Memory. Yep, that's pretty much it. Yep. No, Next up. It does say, I was going to say, it doesn't actually, so I know some people initially with the translation, because uh, this was uh, in a foreign language when it was spoiled, uh, it does say each player may shuffle and then each player who does draw seven. So if you have a Narset in play, you can't like force your opponents to shuffle their hand away, which does kind of suck, but probably good for the game. I agree that it's good for the game and that it would suck if it was the other way. Yes. <laughs> All right, so moving on, we've got Tarnation Vista. This is a land. It enters the battlefield tapped. As it does, you choose a color. It taps for one mana of the chosen color, and then it's got one tap for each color among mono-colored permanents you control. Add one mana of that color. So I have no idea what you do with this, but it is yet another land that can produce more than one mana when you tap it. Yes. 
I so, feel like getting multiple permanents that are monocolored onto the battlefield that are different colors. So it's not a devotion list. You have to, they have to be all different colors. And usually the reason that you want to play a mult, like a deck with multiple colors is so that you can take advantage of the powerful multicolor cards. But here you don't want to have multicolor cards. You want to have monocolor cards. Yes. The thing I was thinking of was Leyline Binding and Sylvan Karyatid are green white. So you only need a third one to make it like add mana from there. Uh, but also at least in standard, it is you know, it is kind of like maybe there's something you can do with it. I don't know. Uh, there is a there's there is a five mana card in standard that is a green enchantment that makes three monocolored tokens of different colors. Uh, I think a killer among us card was insane and limited. Uh, yeah, a killer among us. Um, maybe this much like that's a lot of hoops to jump through for extra mana. But uh, Tarnish and Vista also notably is not legendary like Nykthos. So you can have like four of them in play. And then go from there. So another problem with it is that like because it only makes one color of mana on its first mode. So like before you've set it up, then like usually when you're playing these multicolor decks, you want your triumphs and your dual lands so that you can tap for whatever it is that you need. But this only taps for one specific yep. color. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a deck out there for it because you can Thespian Stage copy it and you'll be able to do the second one. So if you have like uh you know four different monocolored permanents and you have like three of these in play it's a bunch of mana but i don't really know like what scenarios you're really making that work in so i guess there's also there's like another way to get around this problem would be permanents or especially creatures that when they enter they make a token that's a different color than what yes, they are a different color yeah yeah there's a couple of them um the mercenaries are red so if there's anything that's like black that makes a mercenary or white that makes a mercenary um there, there's i think there's a few cards that do that as well i'm actually curious how cheap would you need your cards to be real like realistically probably three or cheaper yeah three or cheaper in, in now I, I think you could get a pass for something that's four or five if it makes like you know three or four different colors maybe this is a card to look at down the line um but i'm not sure currently if there's really anything neat you, you can do with it all right so let's move on to three steps ahead another spree card it's a single blue mana instant and it has one in blue counter target spell so it's a cancel three generic mana create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control two mana draw two then discard a card so notably there is another counter spell that already exists to find a villainous lair or whatever the heck it's called yep. that's a yep. modal cancel slash loot two so this is already better than that its loot mode is better than that and it has another mode of copying a token so yeah Obviously, you need. I think you need to be playing a deck that wants to play either cancel or the loot mode, and then all and then the other modes are additional uh, upside. I mean, I I think this card is ridiculous. I think this is really good. Um, easily the best like three mana counter spell we've like basically ever had in standard and pioneer in in, in years and years and years. Um, I think. This card is so much better than Sinister Sabotage and Absorb and all these things that I think all the blue control decks in Pioneer should just be playing four of this card. Uh, also, I think Creativity and Transmog should be playing four of this card. Uh, there's enough random tokens uh, of your own that you can copy in this format. You can copy Shark tokens as well to just like, you know, get extra damage through. Um, I think this card is really good. Um, I would even consider playing some number in like Phoenix or Prowess. Um, Spirits, just random like, you know, blue decks uh also the pyromancer storm deck with invasion of segovia i th like this card is like the perfect invasion of segovia card as well it works pretty well with pyromancer like so how does this card compare to archmage uh, archmage's charm um i think it's pretty comparable yeah i think it's pretty comparable all right so, yeah it, it, it i think it's i think it's worse because the mode on on archmage's charm of steal something actually came up a ton but I think this card is really, really close. It may actually be better because it's more castable, but I, I think this card is, like, phenomenal. All right. So moving on, we've got Thunder Salvo. This is a two-mana red instant, and it says it deals X damage to target creature, where X is two plus the number of other spells you've cast this turn. Okay, take it away, Resident Phoenix player. Uh, playable. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely playable in Phoenix. Um, you got to do some work to make it deal damage, enough damage, but your threshold is five. Uh, anything bigger than that, what I'm really looking at to do with this is I want a card that kills Archfiend of the Dross. And Lightning Axe does not kill Archfiend of the Dross. So Thunder Salvo can kill Archfiend if you've cast four spells other than Thunder Salvo, which was a lot more unfeasible. But now that Highway Robbery exists, you could set up a plot and you could kill it on five or something. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's definitely playable. Uh, not a slam dunk, but I think you need a reason to play this over a card like Beacon Bolt, but it's possibly there. 
All right. Moving on, we have Tiny Bones joins up. This is a single black legend, single black mana, so one mana, legendary enchantment. It says when it enters, any number of target players each discard a card. And whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, any number of target players each mill a card and lose one life. So outside of any sort of shenanigans that let you like infinitely blink or enter a legendary creature to kill your opponent, I think the one place that I see this showing up is in very, very specific niche black EDH decks that are decks like Tiny Bones, Turgrid, and Nath of the Guilt Leaf that are discard-based decks because those decks already want to play cards that make your opponents discard, especially multiple opponents. And this is a one mono way of doing that that then just has random drain life upside to it. Yeah, I mean, I think this card is really fucking weird. Um, there was a deck I was looking at for Pioneer that can play it. Well, there's a couple. Um, but like there's an Ancient One Verils type deck as well that plays like a lot of legendaries. You probably play Honest Rutstein in that deck, the, uh, Rona, stuff like that. Like maybe that deck wants this. Um, th- I had a weird Kamal's Druidic Vow deck that went like infinite, basically. Um, and like obviously, like infinite shenanigans aside, uh, maybe there's like a Doom Foretold uh, deck or a Beseech deck that like those decks typically there's the card from um, Wild Civil Drain that was one black mana. An opponent discards a card, loses two life, like playing more copies of like one mana enchantments that make the opponent discard a card that you sack the enchantment later uh, to like a Beseech. Um, or something like that so i think there's like some fringe application but it's it's a fucking weird card to me um yeah really weird card also the fact that it's a permanent means you can pick up you can bounce it and play it again with like any of those effects that do that Uh uh-huh yeah you can blink it with yorian you can you can sack it you can yeah so there i i I think i think this is playable but it's weird and it makes you have to deck build differently so all right then we have tiny bones himself the new tiny bones the pickpocket a single black mana one one legendary skeleton rogue it has death touch and it has whenever tiny bones the pickpocket deals combat damage to a player you may cast target non-land permanent card from that player's graveyard and mana of any type can be spent to cast the spell so Upon first look, it immediately looks like the Black Ragavan. However, I think it is much worse than Ragavan. So the question is, how good is it exactly? Is it good enough to see play in Pioneer? Like, where do you want to play Tiny Bones, if at all? I think it will see play. Um, but notably, um, I don't think it's, like, fantastic. I think it's possible decks like Rakdos Sack can play it because they're, like, a Thoughtseize deck that's usually pretty good at clearing the way. Like, Thoughtseize and Blood Tithe Harvester means that you can turn tiny bones into casting their one or two drop which is maybe exciting enough i don't really know um i think where it's a little more appealing is esper legends in standard um but also esper legends and pioneers kind of a fringe deck that periodically pops up they just want more cheap legends that do things um and i think the last one that i'd been looking at was actually rogues because tiny bones is a rogue and rogues is noticeably lacking in a lot of cheap creatures to play but Rogues also plays counter spells, thought sees, fatal pushes, drown in the lock, and it mills over cards from the opponent's deck. So if there was ever a deck I think that can utilize Tiny Bones the most, it probably Rogues in some capacity. Um, so it's like I think you you have to be playing cheap cheap uh, hand disruption and removal I think to make Tiny Bones remote because you have to have something to cast from their graveyard. Yes, yes, and if you're spending mana to kill their blocker, you only get to play the card you killed on curve if you're on the play. So you need something else to matter about this card. All right, moving on past Tiny Bones, we got Torpor Orb Reprint, which means it is now legal in Pioneer and can stop Amalia to some degree. Uh, That's all I can really think of that's doing at the moment. So do you have any other thoughts on Torpor Orb? It's actually pretty reasonable against Convoke. Um, It's fine against the Thraben Inspector in Soul Deck. Uh, It's actually pretty good against Enigmatic, even though they have a lot of ways to remove it. Like most of their creatures are reliant on ETBs uh it's fine against amalia it's not like crazy good but it does shut off skyclave uh and uh ruthless lawbringer at least uh yeah it's it's i mean something that i'm going to try and see is is this worth playing alongside croxa and just like setting that up because currently we had strict proctor but strict proctor plus croxa's three colors and it's just a little bit too much but torpor plus croxa's maybe maybe good enough is there another torpor orb effect besides proctor or another creature besides croxa that's good to set up with it i think is the main issue no but that's okay because crox is just fine on its own so that's that's just the thing about Croxus. like and same with uro was like yeah shutting off the etb and letting the letting you have a creature is good but also just like playing them as cards is good so i i think in that regard it's a little bit less important to have redundancy because you're fine just playing crocs on that well the other one to do with crocs is if you're willing to branch into blue you can go three mana croaks to hold priority slip out the back and then you get both yeah, triggers yes yep yep 
All right. And you could also play like uh, like Tail's End, I guess, too, if you wanted to wait an extra turn and stuff. So moving on from Torpor Orb, the uh, yeah, it's just going to be a sideboard card, as it is everywhere. Yep. Okay. Yep. Unfortunate Accident is a single black mana instant with Spree. The Spree modes are three mana, including a black pip, destroy target creature. So four mana to destroy target creature. And then a single... Uh, black, a single colorless mana, create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token with tap target creature control gets plus one plus zero until end of turn, activate only as a sorcery. So two mana to create a 1-1 one, one mercenary that has the tap pump ability, four mana to kill something or five mana to do both. Yep. So this card, I've been playing one in Rakdos and John Transmog because it does make a token for two mana. At, at instant speed. Yep. Two. Yeah. And then some, it also doubles as a removal spell, albeit a bit expensive, but still doubles as a removal spell. So uh, also... I've been playing a version of Jund Transmog that plays Audience with Tristani uh, as like a draw engine because you play a bunch, you play like Careers Briefcase, you play a bunch of different ones. And this does give you Mercenary, which is another differently named token for Audience with Tristani. All right. P narrow use, but worth discussing at least. Yep. Yep. We have Vadmir New Blood. This is a two mana black 2 2 legendary vampire rogue. It says whenever you commit a crime, put a plus one counter on Vadmir. This ability triggers only once each turn. And as long as Vadmir has four or more plus one counters on it, it has Menace and Lifelink. Why do you want to discuss Vadmir? Yeah, so notably, it is a rogue which is relevant for rogues because Thoughtseize, Fatal Push, stuff like that. Uh, and it's not unreasonable in those kinds of decks to actually just eventually make it a 6-6, a six, six, you know, Lifelinker. Uh, it is also a vampire which with Soren, which is also a deck that can commit a lot of crimes. I'd mentioned before that, like, a lot of the black cards that commit crimes are like pretty good. There's a lot of things that that target graveyard trespasser stuff like that. But where I mostly am playing this right now is in Duelist of the Mind blue black profs because profs eidetic memory puts plus plus one counters on a creature. And so Vodmir also works with Duelist of the Mind thoughts use fatal push stuff like that. But it also just holds plus one plus one counters really really well from profs eidetic memory. Um, you know maybe there's like uh, scenarios where you play blood tithe harvester on two. You play Vodmir. Blood Tithe Harvester, your opponent's creature, put a counter. Fatal Push, their next play, put a counter. Untap. Uh, Thought Seize, then put a counter. Attack. Like, obviously, you know, requires a lot to go right, but that's, like, not unreasonable for the amount of uh, cheap uh, uh, crime-committing effects there are in Pioneer. Um, just, yeah, I think there's a lot of enough, like, weird interactions with this card that it kind of hits all the different things right. It's a vampire. It's a rogue, you know, um, cares about counters. So I think I'm playing two, trying out two in the Prophet's Eidetic Memory deck um, just to kind of see. So there's a lot of stuff kind of grows. I'm fine with two, two mana two twos that don't do anything when they enter, if they can grow a bit. And I think most games, this is probably going to be attacking for three on turn two, which is acceptable. All right. Moving off of Vadmir, we have Visage Bandit. This is a four mana blue two, two creature shapeshifter rogue. You may have it enter the battlefield as a copy of a creature you control, except it's a shapeshifter rogue in addition to its other types, and you can plot it for three mana. So it is... Uh, it's not the cheapest clone because there's another clone that costs three, but it is another cheap clone. It is also, uh, you had mentioned, it, it's a card that you can put into uh, into Garuda decks. Garuda. Yep, yep. And that's basically it, all that is to say? Yeah, I mean, it is a rogue, uh, which I feel like can sometimes matter. Um, but there are some decks where just plotting it and then playing a creature and immediately cloning is valuable. Um, but I think it's mostly Garuda is where I'd be looking at for this card. All right. Moving on, we have Vraska joins up. This is a two mana black and green legendary enchantment. And it says when it enters, put a death touch counter on each creature you control. And whenever a legendary creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So this is not one of the cards I originally had on my list. So why did you want to discuss this? Uh, mostly because similar to uh, Tiny Bones joins up and this whole cycle, there's a lot of incentives to just play a bunch of cheap, you know, kind of aggressive legends and turning them all into drawing a, drawing a card when they connect is is you know something worth looking at um maybe there's some kind of like abzan or four color not you know um legend stack this card also works pretty well with inti because inti gives um trample and you can Vraska's joins up to put a death touch counter on a creature give it trample draw a card because if it's a legendary so works pretty well with inti so I, th I think it's just like this is a weird card that doesn't really slot into anything that may kind of make its own archetype like uh, at least in standard if there's a, like if there's enough like cheap legends you could just play this and then attack we have ashnod skrell uh tiny bones um so we've got a bunch of cheap legends so all right so moving on from this one we've got wily duke at teen hero this is a three mana green and white creature it's a four two legendary human ranger with vigilance 
And it says, whenever it becomes tapped, you gain one life and draw a card. So obviously, because it has Vigilance, you have to figure out a way to tap it. But obviously, this deck is full of saddle creatures. And we have, yeah. in older formats, crewable vehicles as well. well. Smugglers, Copter, yeah, Bankbuster. Yeah. So this is basically the best creature to crew or saddle stuff with. Yes, and I actually have a, a deck like that that I'll be testing later in the week. It's Abzan. It's just like an Abzan mid-range deck. You play Fatal Push, Thoughtseize, Wily, Outcaster, Shouldred, Smuggler's Copter, Caustic Bronco, Seraphic Steed, just all that, you know, Moswa Dread Knight, that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I'm going to test that and see if it's, you know, at all uh, at all playable because Wily Duke is really appealing. Maybe there's a world in which Grease Fang plays Wily plus Smuggler's Copter now um, because... Typically, Grease Fang hasn't been playing very many creatures. If you play that version, uh, you do have more legendary things. Maybe you can leverage some of that. Uh, maybe Tiny Bones joins up in some capacity. Uh, maybe you play Eldritch Evolution if you're playing more creatures. But this is a card that is really cool incentive to build around. And uh, there is another thing you can do with it, which is Springleaf Drum Effects. I'm not sure where you would make that fit. Um, there are also relic of uh, there's the relic one that is yes uh, the taps the legendary yeah for mana. relic of legend yeah. uh, also in standard as well is the green white Catilda that gives lets humans you control tap for a mana of their colors um there's also a bunch of one mana green creatures that say tap another untapped creature you control to add mana um that also work with wily duke uh also convoke effects will work as well so knight errants um things of that nature uh court of calling maybe there's an amalia version that plays wily duke with uh court of calling and knight errant which is sees some play in amalia as well return to the ranks so Convoke Spells also work. So I think there's actually a lot. Um, if you do play a deck like this, you actually get to get really clever in Pioneer, and you get to play an anti amalia sideboard card on the turn you play Wily Duke of Gather Courage, where you can draw the game if they go for the combo, by, and you can just tap the Wily Duke. Uh, so so yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways that like encourages cool deck building mm -hmm. with this card. I would also like to point out that Wily Duke is wielding what appears to be a sword gun torch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right weird one <laughs> so moving on we have uh so that is the end of the cards from outlaws of thunder junction and the big score subset within outlaws so the remaining cards are the commander deck exclusive cards i will preface this by saying there's not that many of them to talk about and the, they're mostly going to slot into legacy storm if they're going to show up anywhere but to begin with we have Embrace the Unknown. This is a three mana red sorcery, and it says exile the top two cards of your library until the end of your next turn. You may play those cards, and it has Retrace, which is you may cast this card from your graveyard by discarding a land card in addition to paying its other costs. So again, because these cards are commander deck exclusives, that means they are not legal in standard, pioneer, modern. They're only going to show up in the oldest formats, namely those being like EDH Legacy Vinted and Popper, if they were Popper legal, but spoiler, none of these are. So... Uh, Storm decks, of course, are always looking to churn through a whole bunch of cards, and this is a card that allows you to exile the top two and play them, and then you can retrace this. So if you've got a bunch of excess mana and extra lands that you don't need, you can just keep retracing this. I don't think this is necessarily better than other Storm engines you can play, but it looks interesting. So what do you think, Dylan? Yeah, I mean, immediately what jumped to mind with me was I want to play this with Life from the Loam and maybe do some cool grindy stuff with that. Uh but, just, uh, just keep getting lands back, pitching them, draw more cards. So this could be like a sideboard and lands or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably not better than like Valkyrie Exploration type cards anyway, but oh, it's kind of cool. All right, so moving on, we have Lock and Load. This is a three mana blue sorcery, and it says draw a card, then draw a card for each other instant and sorcery spell you've cast this turn, and it has plot for four mana. So once again, the my mind immediately goes to a storm deck where you like plot this, wait a turn, and then next turn you cast a bunch of spells, and then you cast lock and load for free draw a bajillion more cards and then storm off yeah i i, I think the the plot is like a really cool really cool aspect on this card sure four mana is a lot more in like uh legacy and vintage but uh could be something at the very least this card, you know card might be cool to try out in like some cube builds and stuff so and then finally our last probable storm card is pyretic charge this is five mana red sorcery and it says discard your hand then draw four cards for each card discarded this way, creatures you control get plus one, plus zero until end of turn, and you can plot it for four mana. So again, it's kind of expensive for Storm, but it's another card that you can yeah. plot on four, and then you can just go, oh, is my hand not very good? Well, I'll just cast this for free, ditch, draw four more cards. Yep. Hmm. It's kind of neat. I wonder if there's some weird, like, hasty bullshit we can do with this. I mean, it's either, like, to me, it's either Storm, or it's, like, some kind of big red deck where you just need to refuel your hand. Yeah. All right. And yeah. then finally, our last card, Rumbleweed. 
is an 11 mana, but not really. 11 mana, green, 8-8 eight, eight plant elemental. And it costs one less to cast for each land card in your graveyard. It has Vigilance, Reach, Trample, and when it enters, other creatures you control get plus three and trample until end of turn. So if there's a deck that is going to fill your graveyard up very fast, especially with lands, so like Dredge or something, or, you know, there's like Crab Vine builds, although I don't know how prevalent those are in Legacy, but so, you know, Self Mill, Crab Vine, or Dredge, this seems like you can get a bunch of lands in your graveyard very quickly, and then you can cast Rumbleweed for as low as one mana, and then get an 8-8 Vigilance, Reach, Trample, that plus three is your team, which is not necessarily crater hoof but pretty similar to it what do you think there used to be uh this meme of like anytime a card was spoiled it went into like nick fit or aggro loam and, like four color loam and stuff and like yeah i mean i want to play this with knight of the reliquary and noble hierarchs and you know stuff like that that's what i want to do with this wastelands you can wasteland your own lands you know life from the so life from the loam potentially like uh sylvan safekeeper yeah sylvan safekeeper yep yep yeah, that's the kind of stuff I want to do with this. It's pretty cool. All right. Well, that is the end of all the cards of Outlaws and all of its uh, three to four adjoining sets. Just to reiterate again, I think the set's really cool. I think I like all the aesthetics of it. It's kind of weird that random cards have wandered into Cowboy Land from other worlds, but whatever. I guess it's like, hey, we'll design the you know 200 or whatever cards that are in Cowboy World and then just stick all the filler cards that we couldn't add to the other sets into here. Don't really know what the thought process was behind it. Yeah, there's a little bit of jarring nature of that. Um, I think I'm okay with it in general. The thing that kind of bothers me is it was kind of pitched as this like uninhabited land. And then we see that there are these inhabitants that are native to the land that are all the plant people. And I would have liked to have seen more of the set showcase the world building of, you know, these fucking plant civilization, these sentient plant civilization people. Um, And instead, it feels like they kind of took a backseat um, the sentient plants. So also like, even though it is weird, I do think that if they make it the norm that there's a bunch of off brand cards from other sets, that's fine. And in particular, it means that they can never again have the excuse of, well, we didn't reprint card X lower, you know, making it, it more of, because it doesn't fit the set, you know, Oh, th- that card has a, you know, an Innistrad name and you know, this isn't an Innistrad set, so we couldn't well, print it here. They put a card in the set that literally said landfall on it. Yeah. Or, or cards that have mechanic, like, I don't. I also don't want to see cards that have basically a mechanic as their ability, but it's just not named because, well, we're not on the landfall, you know, set. Right. right. Yep. Like, just call it landfall. Yeah. Everyone has the internet now. It's fine. Yep. Totally uh, in with that. But other than that, I do feel like you know, not to you know, get all down with negativity and complaining here. I do think the set is overall very good. I like almost every card that I've seen. The only card that I found a little annoying was like Satoru, just because it reminds me of Up the Beanstalk, but. Who knows if it's even that good. But other than that, it looks really fun. I think Plot is one of the best mechanics they've ever made. Looks great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm a fan. I may actually come out to pre-release for this set. (laughs) Just because it looks like a fun, sealed thing to do. When is pre-release for this set anyway? I think it's this weekend. Hmm. So pretty soon. All right, well, thank you very much for joining, joining me, Dylan. Yeah. And that wraps up our Outlaws of Thunder Junction Big Score Commander Outlaws set review. And uh, hope you guys will join us next time.